Good afternoon and welcome to the National Capital Planning Commission's February 1st, 2024 open session. First, Ms. Coster, can you please take the roll? Certainly. Uh, Commissioner Kozar? Here. Thank you. Commissioner McMahon? Good afternoon. Thank you. Commissioner Stidham? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Argo? I'm here. Thank you. Vice Chair Hewlett? Here. Thank you. Chair Goodman? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Green? Here. Commissioner Wright? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Dixon? Here. Uh, Commissioner Cash uh, informed me he would be joining late. Commissioner Davis? Here. Thank you. And Commissioner Hassett? Here. Thank you. Noting the presence of a quorum, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Today's meeting is live streamed and will be available in a few days um, as a video on the NCPC website. And if there's no objection, the agenda as posted is adopted and will be the order of business. We will now play a short video clip of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to, the flag, to the United, United States, States, of America, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. NCPC will continue to conduct our meetings online until the renovations in the commission chambers are complete. And I want to share how we will conduct commission business. Following staff presentations and any other testimony, I will ask for a motion and a second as appropriate. During the commission deliberations, I'll use the round robin format and each asking each commissioner if they have any comments. At other times when commissioners wish to be recognized, please unmute and, and ask for the floor. Um, uh, at this time, we have uh, the report from the chair, agenda item number two, and today we have uh, Diane Sullivan, who is acting chair for the meeting today. Diane? Good afternoon. I just have one update today. On January 27th, NCPC hosted a virtual public meeting to present an update on the comprehensive plans draft introduction chapter and submission guidelines, which you all saw in January. Uh, the update uh, in addresses critical planning challenges and current agency initiatives, including those related to equity, climate change, and resiliency. Uh, NCPC will host an in-person uh, public meeting on February 20th here at our offices in downtown DC, and public comments on the draft documents will be accepted through March 12th, 2024. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan, and I do want to apologize. I went out of order. That was the uh, report from the executive director, and now the report from the chair, which is which is my report. And I just want to say that last Tuesday, this is to me was just an exceptional event. But we are celebrating our 100 year anniversary this year as National Capital Planning Commission, and um, to kick it off, uh, we had a wonderful. Um, panel of six speakers who did a fantastic job of taking an historic uh, look at historic planning documents and making them real and relevant uh, for today and, and, and demonstrating both where we have come from and where we are going. Uh, Marcel, and uh, who is not here with us today, and Anita, your opening comments really helped to frame the importance of reflecting on the shared history and, and how it informs our work today. And um, if you weren't able to tune in, I encourage any of you to, who can to go to NCPC's website and watch it. It was it was truly, truly exceptional. And I also want to thank uh, Ms. Coster for her leadership and planning not only this event, but the other NCPC uh, centennial events. So um, just kudos to, to staff and to the guest speakers and truly exceptional kickoff for our 100 year anniversary. Um, and that is my report. Agenda item number four. Ms. Schuyler, do you have a legislative update? Uh, no, I do not, Madam Chair. All's quiet on the legislative front. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And agenda item number five 
um, uh, is the consent calendar. And today we have three items on the consent calendar. The first is to approve preliminary and final building plans with comments for the Robert C. Weaver Federal Building Antenna Array modifications submitted by the General Services Agency. Um, the second is to approve preliminary and final building plans with comments for the Hubert Humphrey Building Antenna array modifications submitted by General Services Administration. And the last item is to approve comments on concept plans for the District of Columbia Armory Vehicle Control Point Design Plan submitted by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. All these projects are in Washington, D.C. Are there any questions or discussion? Vice Chair Hewlett, no? Okay. No, I was ready to make a motion to approve the Oh, feel well, free. I'll second that motion. Yeah. Okay, then it's been moved. the entire uh, consent calendar. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Ms. Coster, can you please confirm the motion in the second and take vote by roll call? Thank you. Uh, the motion was made by Vice Chair Hewlett and seconded by Commissioner Wright uh, for the consent calendar. And with that, Commissioner Kozar? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner McMahon? Yes. Commissioner Stidham? Yes. Commissioner Argo? Yes. I'll come back. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Hewlett? Yes. Uh, Chair Goodman? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Green? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Wright? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Dixon? Yes. Thank you. Uh, and Commissioner Hassett? Yes. And my apologies, I just hopped right over Commissioner Davis. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Coster, and the motion has carried. Agenda item 6A is to approve preliminary and final site development plans for the Anacostia Riverwalk Trail Extension and National Arboretum Access Bridge. Um, so today, Mr. Weil will be making the presentation on that project. Mr. Weil. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will share my screen now. Okay. Can can you all see that? No, not yet. No. No. Okay. Okay, let me try that again. That one. Yeah. Okay. Okay, hopefully that worked. Yes, yes, we can see it okay. now. Thank you. Thank you very much. I apologize. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Goodman and members of the Commission. The National Park Service, in collaboration with DDOT, proposes to extend the Riverwalk Trail in Anacostia Park, uh, which includes a new multi use bridge across the Anacostia River. Uh, and this will allow direct pedestrian and bicycle access to the National Arboretum from the east and between neighborhoods along both sides of the river. The Commission previously reviewed this project as a concept submission back in 2017, expressing support and noting the project's importance to the overall river, river walk trail network and neighborhood connectivity in the area. As a combined preliminary and final proposal, we are considering things like the site layout, the landscape design, proposed signage, and whether the applicant has adequately addressed NCPC's previous comments related to trail user safety, river navigation, and community coordination. 
The project is part of a planned 28 mile trail network along the river known as the Anacostia Riverwalk Trail intended to improve access to the river and to celebrate the river as a city amenity serving a variety of recreational users including pedestrians, joggers, bicyclists, wildlife observers, fishermen and boaters. Today, a majority of the Riverwalk Trail Network has been constructed as reflected here in this DDOT trail map. The concept for the trail was born out of the, out of the 1997 Legacy Plan and 2000 Anacostia Waterfront Initiative. And after a multi-year planning process, which included a 125 member citizen advisory group of stakeholder agencies, multiple ANCs and participation from 25 different federal and district agencies, the Riverwalk Trail was laid out through the 2003 Anacostia Waterfront Framework Plan and repeatedly endorsed over the past 20 plus years by numerous plans that include the Move DC Plan, National Park Service's Anacostia Park Management Plan, and the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments Visualize 2045 Plan to name a few. And we reflect the Riverwalk's uh, trail's origins and its two decades of continued support through our uh, final executive director's recommendation comments. So here's the project location in Northeast Washington, DC. The site is situated in a section of Anacostia Park that is known as Kenilworth Park North. Here we can see the proposed new trail extension aligned to the Southwest of the existing Riverwalk Trail. The new extension would cross over the river and land just outside of the National Arboretum's perimeter fence. Here's a satellite photo of the area with the proposed new trail alignment and some ground level photos of its future tie in location. The trail would cross through a small meadow area with trees and cross over open recreational fields along a riverfront tree buffer area. The alignment then turns to the west where it crosses through the tree buffer and crosses over the river. Here's a view that looks back toward the east bank where the new bridge would be. From here, the proposed trail extension would mostly align along an existing dirt maintenance road trail just outside of the perimeter fence. The new trail would continue to connect to existing pedestrian gates into the Arboretum with access available between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., seven days a week, and these open hours would continue after the new trail extension is in place. We note our support of the new trail alignment in the executive director's comments, which crosses over mostly open fields and along an existing trail and thus this reduces the need to remove existing trees and vegetation within the project area. Historically, much of Anacostia Park was previously operated by the District of Columbia as a landfill between 1942 and 1970. And prior to that, the site consisted of lower lying wetlands and recreational lakes developed by the United States Army Corps of Engineers in the 1930s. Currently, there is a layer of clay rich soil that has been placed over the former landfill area to the east of the river as a cap over the contaminated soil beneath the park. The National Park Service manages the land and under the federal CERCLA program, which stands for Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation and Liability Act, the Park Service has developed an environmental remediation plan that requires additional clean soil and a geotextile fabric uh, barrier to be installed over areas for organized sports, recreation, community activities, and special events in the future. And this would apply to the proposed new trail extension as well. Today, Anacostia Park is a unit of the National Park System managed by National Capital Parks East. The park encompasses over 1,100 acres along the Anacostia River, including parts of the Southwest Waterfront, James Creek and Buzzard Point Park, with notable areas such as Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens, Kenilworth Marth Marsh, Watts, Br Watts Branch, and Lower Beaver Dam Creek. And the park is unique in that it encompasses one of the district's last surviving tidal wetlands. 
The project site is currently under the jurisdiction of the National Park Service. However, this portion of the park will soon be transferred over to the District of Columbia and managed by the District Department of Parks and Recreation as a city park. In light of the upcoming transfer, DPR will begin a year-long master planning process building upon a recent citywide parks and recreational facilities master plan known as the Ready to Play Plan. The plan calls for a variety of future improvements here that include nature trails, water-based recreation, environmental education, a spray park, and community gardens. This project is part of an ongoing effort to realign the Riverwalk Trail Network, originally routed along neighborhood streets through this part of the city, which is shown here in yellow. The Park Service and DDOT are gradually realigning the route closer to the river. The realigned route is consistent with many other existing sections of the Riverwalk Trail that are currently on the river, as seen here in these photos. And the realignment supports the stated purpose and needs statement, which is to improve connectivity for visitors and neighborhood residents to the west bank of the Anacostia River and to provide direct access to the National Arboretum. In the future, DDOT and the National Park Service plan to continue the Riverwalk Trail along the river's east bank and tying into the trail extension that is under review here by the commission today. In addition to the city's ambitious plan to improve its recreational amenities, the district has also recently prioritized the expansion of its pedestrian and bicycle routes throughout the city and, and today's project would support that effort. This slide depicts an area of 140,000 district residents who live within a half mile of the Anacostia River within walking and easy biking distance of the trail network today. And we note this figure in our executive director's recommendation comments. The new trail extension and cross river connection would be an important link in the Riverwalk Trail system. The Arboretum Access Bridge would establish a new crossing point for nearby Ward 7 residents to the Arboretum and other points west of the river in the city, breaking up a three and a half mile stretch that does not currently have any pedestrian or bicycle crossings today. Traditionally, this part of the city has suffered from poor access to downtown jobs, amenities, and our national monuments and museums that are located in the National Mall area. And while DDOT does plan to improve the New York Avenue Bridge to accommodate pedestrian and bicycle crossings in the future, that crossing would be much less direct than an access bridge near the Arboretum for Mayfair, Eastland Gardens, and other nearby Ward 7 uh, neighborhoods. And a New York Avenue crossing as a retrofitted highway bridge would offer a much different crossing experience than with the new access bridge, which is designed specifically for pedestrian and bicycle use. And this improved accessibility would benefit both sides of the river by connecting Ward 5 neighborhoods to the east side of the river in places like Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens. And we capture this point as a finding in our final executive director's recommendation. As illustrated here, DDOT and the National Park Service do plan to extend the new trail even further to the west outside of the Arboretum fence line as funding becomes available, strengthening this east-west connection with 24-hour access to M Street Northeast as reflected in our comments. In the meantime, however, until that future 24-hour connection is available, the National Park Service and DDOT should work with the Arboretum to locate appropriate signage along the new trail extension, especially to the east of the bridge, to inform trail users about access availability through the Arboretum only when its grounds are open to the public. So with that context, I will now go through the project proposal before us here today. The new asphalt trail would match the existing Riverwalk Trail, which is intended to offer trail users with a high quality walking and bicycling experience and designed to meet AASHTO, District, and Americans with Disability Act standards. The trail would be 10 feet wide with two opposing five foot travel lanes and a sloped one to two foot high embankment along both sides as required by the park's environmental remediation plan to avoid interfering with the park's existing landfill cap. 
The new bridge is designed as a multi-use structure, specifically for pedestrian and bicycle travel across the river, with additional space outside of the travel lanes to allow people to linger and you to use the bridge as an elevated vantage point from which to enjoy the surrounding natural scenery and elevated uh, views of the river. New bridge is designed as a 390 foot continuous span steel eye girder structure supported by three piers in the river. The piers, uh, the bridge's pier locations result in two narrower 70 two foot clearances that are closer to the riverbanks and two wider 123 foot clearances out on the river to maximize under bridge navigational safety for boaters. The current design is relatively similar to the 2017 submission, which was su supported by our commission, but had slightly narrower 120 foot wide clearances out on the river. The pier locations avoid historic riverbank sea walls, and they also avoid the river's 80-foot navigable channel, which is a mandatory permit, uh, permitting requirement uh, set by the United States Coast Guard. For comparison purposes, the widest pier clearances for the Benning Road Bridge to the south and the New York Avenue and Amtrak bridges to the north are 110 feet, 114 feet, and 70 feet respectively. Uh, which are significantly narrower than the new access bridges 123 foot clearances on the river. Here are some rendered perspectives of the access bridge looking across the bridge, an elevated perspective looking from the Arboretum side of the river in the upper right, and then a water level view on the lower left and a view from the east bank on the bottom right. The National Park Service's primary design goal for the new crossing is to minimize the scale of the bridge so as to minimize its uh, visual impact to the river and surrounding park environment. And this is reflected in the current proposed bridge design from its use of materials to its color scheme to the style of bridge selected itself. When considering the existing environmental and topographic constraints that are present around the project site, the steep grade of the Arboretum property to the west, the landfill contamination to the east of the river, and the width of the river, there are a limited number of bridge designs that are technically feasible in this situation. Although there has been some interest in a clear span bridge here with no piers in the river, each of these designs would require larger, more visible, complex structural elements, adding to the construction, inspection, and maintenance costs, and require larger areas of disturbance and excavation, and none of these bridge types would meet the, proje the project's primary design goal of a minimal structure. Here's a comparison between the proposed three-pier bridge design, which is shaded here in gray, and a tide arch clear span bridge, and you can see the differences in length, the depth of its anchoring abutments, and its higher arch that would be necessary to support the bridge span. Here's a second illustration that compares another type of clear span design known as a cable stayed bridge. And again, you will note the bridge is much larger structural elements uh, that would result in significant visual and environmental impacts to the surrounding parkland. And we note these considerations in our executive director's comments, which preclude the use of a clear span bridge as part of this project. The National Park Service did consider some more realistic, lower profile bridge types as part of the project's environmental assessment, bridges with two and three piers in the river. However, two, spear, uh, two pier design would require a pier to be placed within the navigable river channel, which would not meet the U.S. Coast Guard's permitting requirements. And so DDOT and the National Park Service ultimately selected a three pier bridge design for the project. As part of the design process, DDOT has adjusted the pier locations as much as possible to maximize the widths of the, the main river clearances, and to accommodate two sets of competition rowing lanes as illustrated here on this slide. The bridge piers will be reinforced concrete with tapered forms that narrow toward their base, 
to minimize their ground disturbance and their profile on the river surface, unlike the much thicker, blockier piers that exist out on the river today. The piers would have recessed natural stone faces to match the color and look of the nearby seawalls, uh, which are historic, as well as the bridge abutment wing walls. And the bridge would have modern, curved, post and cable style railings, both to maximize views of the river from the deck of the bridge, and the railings would not have any protruding supports that could pose a safety hazard for cyclists. And finally, the new bridge would have an earth-toned monochromatic color scheme, which would be supported, which was supported by the Commission of Fine Arts that befits, befits its surrounding park environment and is reflective of other nearby trail bridges. And we capture these benefits and the rationale behind the selection of the current bridge design as part of our final executive director's recommendation comments. Moving on to the project's landscape plans, there are three primary planting nodes along the new trail, one of which is its connection to the existing Riverwalk Trail. The project would plant some new over and understory trees, as well as establish a new meadow area for bird habitat and install new wayfinding signage here. Moving to the south, a second node would center around a new paved circular plaza with side, with side benches and new wayfinding signage. And this is where the trail would turn west to approach the new multi-use bridge. The project would remove invasive vegetation and plant seven, 17 new shade trees, 10 new ornamental trees, along with native shrubs to include uh, milkweed and other pollinator plants. The new landscaping would expand the wooded buffer area along the river and add to available wildlife habitat in the park. And this node would become a three-way intersection when DDOT and the Park Service extend the trail further to the south along the east side of the river to provide a more direct connection to the Benning Road corridor. A third node on the Arboretum side of the river is designed as a future gathering space with access to the underside of the bridge, new wayfinding signage and seating, uh, and the applicant would remove invasive vegetation here to improve the area's ecological health and to improve views of the river. The proposed planting palette would establish an upland community of na native over and understory trees and native shrubs. In total, the project would remove 36 trees, some of which are not native to the area and or are in poor health along with uh, invasive kudzu and other vegetation, and plant all new native shrubs and trees, 98 in total, uh, which is consistent with NCPC's tree replacement policy. And we note this in our final executive director's recommendation comments. Since the commission's previous 2017 review, in addition to responding to many requests for information, questions and comments outside of formal meetings, DDOT and the National Park Service have hosted three larger public outreach meetings, most recently last summer in July. And the project team has also met with smaller stakeholder groups that include several nearby ANCs, as well as members of the Anacostia Watershed Citizens Advisory Committee and the Competitive Rowing Community. Listening and incorporating their feedback into the project as much as possible, while still ensuring the project will meet district and National Park Service goals and objectives and meeting mandatory permitting requirements. In summary, many public comments recognize the benefit of the project related to improved cross river connectivity and the project's benefit to equitable access in this part of the city. Although some comments still express concern regarding the impact of the piers on river users and river sedimentation. However, DDOT and the National Park Service feel they have addressed all of these issues through the current project design proposal that is before us here today for review. And we recognize this previous outreach and project coordination by DDOT and the Park Service over many years as part of our executive director's comments. In addition, we note that this public outreach will continue in the future as the district takes over management of the larger Kenilworth North Park area and DPR initiates their master planning process for that. The local community will have additional opportunities to help shape the future of the park 
as reflected in our executive director's recommendation. And as part of this future community engagement, NCPC staff requests that NPS and DDOT continue to coordinate this and other planned river walk trail extensions with the local community, the National Arboretum and other stakeholder groups. And we also note that if future planning for Kenilworth Park, the North area does identify a need to change the current planned trail alignment for any reason, then the district should submit these changes to NCPC for review, along with the future master plan for the park. So with that, here's the executive director's recommendation, and this uh, continues over the next few slides. However, I will not go through each point as I have already summarized these comments as part of my presentation. But before I conclude, I would like to note that we have several people who are here on behalf of the project. Uh, first, we have uh, Michael Camiso, who is the National Capital Parks East Deputy Superintendent, and he would like to make a statement on behalf of the project. And then once the public uh, testimony concludes, Kyle Olson, who is a DDOT engineer and lead design manager for the project and his team, will be available for questions related to the bridge design, sedimentation, project con con construction and permitting, and other more technical questions. Um, and then we also have uh, Laurel Hemig, who is the project manager with the National Park Service, and she and other NPS staff will be available for questions related to the park itself, its history, the project section uh, 106 and NEPA processes, and the park's uh, environmental remediation efforts under the federal CERCLA process. So thank you, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Weil. Do we have uh, Deputy Superintendent My Michael Camiso here to make any remarks? Did he want to do that yes. or not? I'm, I'm here. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Weil, for your presentation today on this project. Uh, as you stated, I'm Mike Camiso. I'm the Deputy Superintendent here at National Capital Parks East. It's nice to see you all. Uh, I'm pleased to be here today uh, as we discuss the Arboretum Bridge project. Uh, as Michael pointed out, this project is situated entirely uh, on National Park Service land, and upon completion will create a connection between the National Arboretum, Kenilworth Park, uh, and Aquatic Gardens, and adjacent neighborhoods including Mayfair, Kenilworth Parkside, Eastland Gardens, River Terrace, and neighboring communities in Maryland. This project is important to the National Park Service and to the district as it will improve mobility along the Anacostia River and connect visitors and residents to the district's natural environment and other recreational amenities. During the development of this project, a number of locations uh, were explored. This location was chosen because it had the fewest impacts to surrounding wetlands, contaminated land in Kenilworth Park South, and potential archeological sites. It's also an area with fewer trees and areas upstream and could be built perpendicular to both shorelines, uh, which shortens the span. Locating the bridge further downstream would prevent this direct connection to the National Arboretum and adjacent communities. As was stated, the Commission of Fine Arts instructed the team to design the lowest profile bridge possible so that the view shed obstruction would be minimized. Uh, views within the area were a key feature that was evaluated when looking at the location and the design of the bridge. Uh, to avoid the aesthetic imp impacts on the view shed, the bridge structure was required to meet NPS standards and to blend with the surrounding and natural environment of Kenilworth Park. Prior to selecting the proposed design, the design team undertook a bridge type study and evaluated several bridge types, and the selected option creates the least impact to the environment. All user groups were considered during the design stage of the bridge. Safety of the river users was a key consideration in developing the bridge design. The team spent a considerable amount of time working with the rowing community to understand their concerns and the modified pier location several times to ensure that the existing rowing channels remained open. The design team believes that the proposed configuration will be beneficial. It improves the rowing community's request to maintain rowing lanes. It partially preserves the previous four span concept, which is still the best all around option, and it achieves the MPS goal for the lowest profile and lowest footprint design. The clear span design would have required, well, is require a larger, more visible structure that would be both environmentally and visually intrusive. 
So while there are various projects located in and adjacent to Kenilworth Park that are extremely important to the health of the Anacostia River and the vitality of the community, they are not dependent on, nor will they be affected by the construction of the pedestrian bridge to the National Arboretum. Construction of a pedestrian bridge has been and will continue to be coordinated with other work taking place in the area and with future projects as they are being developed. So in closing, this is a special place along the Anacostia River, which few residents or visitors actually have access to. This is a project that provides a unique opportunity to improve access to extraordinary park spaces and is a huge step forward in providing equitable access to and across the Anacostia River for everyone. I wanna thank you all for your attention to this and, and, and review of this project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Superintendent Camiso. We appreciate your, your remarks and thank you again, Mr. Weil. Do uh, commissioners have any questions right now for our presenters? Commissioners, any questions? Okay, hearing none, um, I want to uh, let everyone know that we we actually uh, do have uh, 18 people signed up to speak today. Um, just a reminder, if you're speaking on behalf of yourself, uh, we have a three-minute limit. If you're speaking on behalf of an organization, you do have a five-minute limit, and Ms. Coster is going to be keeping time. But I also want to say, and this is all great news, that we've received 67-plus responses from the public on this project. So I think it's exciting not only is the project exciting, in my opinion, but the public engagement around it um, is also promising uh, because it demonstrates people who care about this space. So having said that, I will move right along. Um, the commission has received copies of all the testimony. It will be available on our website if you wish to um, see those. But for right now, I'd like to recognize our first speaker, um, and it, Artily Wright, you have three minutes to provide your testimony. Could you let us know when you're ready? I'm ready, can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you, go ahead. So good afternoon, I'm Ardley Wright. I am a resident of the Parkside neighborhood, which is one of the neighborhoods that will be directly impacted and benefit from um, the Arboretum Bridge. Um, I wanna thank you all for considering my perspective um, as it relates to this pedestrian and bike bridge. Um, and I would like to voice my full support for this bridge. Um, it provides a much needed alternative access point. Um, and I believe that DOT has gone above and beyond um, over the past five years to inform the public and gather feedback. This bridge will allow people from my neighborhood and other parts of Ward 7 um, to include Parkside, Kenilworth, Eastland Gardens, et cetera to access um, the Arboretum and other parts of Ward 5 um, in a safer uh, and faster uh, way. Um, I've updated my kind of my green screen so you can see um, that blue dot is what it would take for me to bike or walk to the Arboretum. Um, as you can see, that red line that I've made right there, um, that's the pedestrian bridge that is proposed. Um, as you can see, it's a much faster way for me to get to um, a green space that really connects with our community. Um, and so I just want to, you know, emphasize that connection um, is really the key for this bridge. Um, the communities adjacent to the Anacostia River have been unfairly um, disconnected for decades. Um, and so, you know, to have to go, you know, two and a half miles or three miles just to access um, that, you know, the, the Arboretum, like that's unfair. Like I should be able to do this in, you know, a 10 to 15 minute white, uh, bike or, um, or walk. And so I'm really, really hoping that the commission uh, does consider this uh, bridge and, and pushes it forward. Um, but I also wanted to like highlight one more piece um, that I think has been a part of like some of the opposition comments with respect to the gates um, associated with the, the bridge crossing closing at certain times of the day. Um, and I do wanna emphasize that I think that that point is null and void because NPS has a precedent of closing gates to entry points um, and other parks uh, throughout the city, the sculpture garden and the zoo uh, being two big examples. So again, those access points are closed and open uh, daily at certain times. And so I don't think that, you know, 
this particular bridge uh, entrance to the Arboretum closing at a certain time of day or not being open 24 hours um, should be you know, a factor for consideration of not approving this bridge. And with that, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Wright. And does anyone have a question for um, our presenter right now? Any questions for Ms. Wright? Thank you very much for your contr contributions. Thank you. Our second speaker is Marion Dombros Dombrowski with the Anacostia Watershed Community Advisory Committee. Um, you will have five minutes to provide your testimony. Please let us know when you are ready. Um, Ms. Dombrowski? I, I, yes? I, I'm uh, basically ready. Uh, this okay. is a lot in five minutes, but uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, whoops. I need to share my screen. Um, oh. Is it, do you see my screen now? The uh, No, we don't. Um, I'm sorry. Ms. Dombrowski, if you yes. are having difficulty, we can share uh, your your slides and you can just say next slide. Okay. Um, well, I, oh, let me, can I try one more time? I'm sorry. Do you see it now? No. No. Okay. Uh, we practiced this the other day. Um, Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, if you don't mind, uh, sure. Yeah, Mr. Champ, yeah. could you share those slides, please? Well, um, I can't see them. Are they shared? Yes, uh, not yet. Um, okay, thank you. There we go. I think the okay. slides are up. Okay. Um, is so there any way to make them full screen? Oh, oh, okay. I, anyway. I think let's just keep keep going, and I'll ask Mr. Chan to do that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Marion Dombrowski, uh, representing the Anacostia Watershed Community Advisory Committee. Four of our members are also uh, mayoral appointees to the Leadership Council for a Cleaner Anacostia River. Uh, next slide, please. We have serious concerns regarding this proposal and ask for your intervention. Uh, next slide. OCAC and Anacostia Riverkeeper have worked to fill the gap in outreach. When we recognized a shared need, uh, Anacostia Parks and Community Collaborative joined us and uh, began a partnership, which we intend to continue through the long years it's going to take to develop and realize a shared and bold vision for the Anacostia. Next slide, please. Uh, though the community largely agrees on the need for a river crossing, the siting and design of this proposal fails to achieve the purpose and aspirations for the river and Kenilworth Park. Instead, it offers a short-sighted transportation project or no action. We cannot afford either. This project is premature. Uh, I should be on slide five, I'm sorry. Uh, can you advance? Yeah, right there. Um, we urge the commission to pause this project so it can be coordinated with larger efforts currently underway. Um, and uh, next slide, please. Uh, looking at the refresh of the NEAT uh, documentations, uh, you can see that there, uh, well, there are several uh, crucial impacts that were not considered. One is the um, design impact of the bridge and trail location on the park. The other is um, impact to current navigation and future river use. Next slide, please. Uh, if were this project to go forward, Ward 7 would be denied the opportunity to benefit from decades of work and billions of dollars investment. Uh, this outcome is unacceptable. Next slide, please. Mayor Bowser recognized this unique area when she established Kingman and Heritage State Conservation and Critical Wildlife Areas. This two-mile reach retains a naturalistic quality 
without interruption, despite being in the heart of a dense urban area. This is absolutely unparalleled in any major city. The value of this environment is inestimable. The current proposal fails to acknowledge or respect the environment uh, in, to which it should be it should contribute. Next slide, please. A navigation import repack, uh, report has not been filed. Without it, the Coast Guard will not issue a bridge permit. The drawings do not reflect the uh, 2019 bathymetric save uh, survey. This is a showstopper. This water is too shallow for navigation. Next slide, please. Flood risk reduction was also omitted from the EA. Ward 7 is one of the district's most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. This crucial planning effort must proceed, precede this project. Next slide, please. Uh, the purpose and need, um, these, uh, uh, the in, um, original purpose and need have not been met. They do not, it does not connect to the surrounding neighborhoods. And uh, it also robs Kenilworth of its most unique fe feature, which is the waterfront. Next slide, please. Uh, in future, in frequently asked questions, um, uh, the um, to provide a safe and convenient means for uh, park visitors to access the National Arboretum, this was never uh, uh, identified in any NEPA documents. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what happened to the boat launches? Frequently asked question states that several have been installed, making the need redundant in fact, two existing launches have been replaced and one removed. That's a net loss of one. Uh, and there is no safe refuge in this entire riverfront, none. A seawall, a four foot seawall at low tide uh, blocks access and entrance to the river. A dock in Kenilworth Park is not re redundant, it is essential. Next slide, please. When the phase one realignment was removed, it er eliminated a desperately needed connection, one with unrestricted access uh, tied to a river crossing. Um, next slide, please. Uh, a direct trail connection through Kenilworth Park South is necessary and could be fulfilled using the existing natural surface trail. Uh, the proposed phase two alignment would pave the entire waterfront. It would fragment. Five minutes, Ms. Dombrowski. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that is five know. minutes. That's five minutes. Yes. Okay. Can you advance to the last slide, please? Oh, the one before that. Sorry. Um, yeah. Anyway, these are our recommendations. Uh, and this project needs further discussion. Uh, and I invite any questions. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dombrowski. We appreciate your comments. And um, now, do, are there any questions for Ms. Dombrowski from the commissioners? Any questions? Hearing none, we're going to move on. Thank you. Uh, number three is Mr. Shelley, Mr. Shelley Rep speaking on behalf of the Committee of 100. Mr. Rep, you have five minutes to provide testimony. Please let us know when you're ready. Okay, well, I am ready. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, You're welcome. Uh, Chair Goodman and Commission members, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today regarding the proposed Anacostia River Walk Trail and National Arboretum Access Bridge. My name is Shelley Rep, and I am chair and speaking on behalf of the Committee of 100. First, I want to congratulate you on your centennial. The National Capital Planning Commission has played an important role in enhancing and maintaining the beauty and livability of Washington, D.C. As you know, the Committee of 100 celebrated its 100th anniversary just last year. With respect to, to this project, the Committee of 100 has reviewed the very cogent comments of the Anacostia Water shed community advisory committee as, and is impressed by the points they raise. We note, for example, that the advisory committee states that the trail and bridge as proposed would prevent recreational use of the Anacostia by the entire, for the entire two mile waterfront in Ward 7, thus preventing the opportunity for safe river access by residents. residents. This defi deficiency needs to be addressed. I would be remiss if I also didn't mention that the updated plans for the west side of the Anacostia are, um, 
are, are in need of review due to the potential development of the RFK property and Reservation 13. This project is noteworthy because it would add a new bicycle and walking trail section, a new bicycle footbridge across the Anacostia, and new access and visibility to the National Arboretum. As you may have noted in our October 25th letter to the commission, we have suggested that the city's river front trails and recreation segments be connected, filling existing gaps and branded uh, or understood as a totality from border to border, not trail by trail or site by site as they currently are. Much work has been done and most of the trails along the two rivers are comprised of popular and finished or planned elements. What we are proposing is the filling in of the relatively small gaps and making people aware of this potentially amazing recreational resource. In addition to filling the gaps, it would likely involve improving signage and possibly unified branding of those segments with a new identification such as the Washington Waterfront Walk so that the public can better understand the continuous nature of the trail. This idea would not necessarily require renaming any existing trail, nor changing ownership or management, much of which is under the stewardship of the National Park Service. What this would do is provide a unified identity which can better serve citizen awareness and appreciation, not currently realized on a peaceful meal basis. Understanding and seeing the riverfronts as a unitary resource is not a new policy interest. In fact, in your own 1997 report, Extending the Legacy, a similar concept was emphasized for the benefit of residents and visitors alike. And in 2003, the DC Office of Planning released the Anacostia Waterfront Framework Plan. The plan, prepared in collaboration with 20 district and federal agencies, including the NCPC, outlined a comprehensive approach to restoring and enhancing the area along and near the Anacostia River in Washington, D.C. By filling in the gaps and branding all the district's shorelines as a unified resource, the concept would raise awareness of the totality of the river shores resource throughout the district. It would help citizens and visitors better value the river's shores in the nation's capital, both in protection and enjoyment. This is particularly critical, particularly critical notion, given the Army Corps of Engineers prediction of climate change caused river rise throughout the city in the not dear near, not too distant future. The Committee 100 can think of no better or more appropriate body to champion the completion of this continuous trail and this overall concept than the National Capital Planning Commission. And there is no better time than your centennial ob observations in 2024 to make this happen. The Washington Waterfront Walk, we argue, is a concept whose time has come. What an extraordinary asset for local com communities and visitors and to the character of the nation's capital. Again, congratulations on your 100th anniversary. We hope the NCPC will consider, consider adopting the Washington Waterfront Walk as one of its centennial initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rep, for your thoughtful remarks and contributions. Are there any questions for Mr. Rep? Any questions? Yes, Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Commissioner I, Dixon. I just wanted to uh, make one comment about the naming of this uh, this walk. I, I, I hope we can include the Anacostia name in it since it's near the river. And as some of you might know, I, I like Anacostia River East Walk. Uh, the, the Washington Walk doesn't focus on the river, which has uh, a lot of spiritual and in, in Native American and historical significance. So wherever we can include the name of our river in our description, it would be use, useful. But uh, anyhow, that's just a comment. That, uh, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Dixon, for your comment. Uh, is there are there any questions for for Mr. Rep? Any further comment or questions for Mr. Rep? Hearing none. Thank you very much. And moving on, we have number four. Our speaker is Ann Lewis. However, she called in. She's unable uh, to present today um, uh, due to illness. And so we're moving on. Then the next speaker will be Jerome Herbers. Mr. Herbers, you have three minutes to provide your testimony. Let us know when you are ready.
Mr. Herbers. Mr. Herbers. Let's see if you can hear me now. Yes, sir. We can okay, hear you now. Thank Go you. I appreciate okay. the opportunity. Uh, I you appreciate bet. the opportunity to speak before the National Capital Planning Commission. Um, I'm an enthusiastic biker and rower, and I greatly appreciate the Anacostia River for its unique opportunities to experience nature on the water and from the shore. The improvements to the river and the river environment promise opportunities for more residents to enjoy nature on the riverbanks and on the water. Kenilworth Park, adjacent to the river on the east side, currently lacks meaningful access to the river for those who wish to fish, boat, and eventually swim. The proposed plan for a new bridge across the Anacostia offers no options for access to the river for fishermen, boaters, and swimmers, and in fact, greatly limits options for future development there. There's much more to say, but I'd like to briefly comment on two assertions made in the documents that accompany this meeting's agenda. First, uh, the one that's labeled NCPC NEPA document FONSI, I love that, finding of no significant impact. That document states that, quote, the project will not have a significant impact on the quality of the human environment, close quotes. This statement is remarkable in that it makes no reference to people who are on the river in boats or fishing at the riverside on a daily basis. Has any report ever delineated the numbers of people at or on the river during any period of time? Has there been any, any systematic inquiry into the possible impact on those users? Second, depictions of the navigational channels under the proposed bridge are simply inaccurate. Because water depth in this tidal river is insufficient for navigation under the east span, that's span three in the documents, the resulting bottleneck would create a very serious safety concern for river users, in particular, for teenage and young rowers from three universities and multiple high schools. As a rower, I frequent that area of the river and I can personally attest that the proposed east side channel is too shallow for navigation. I also note that there's no plan to increase river depth through dredging. A new bridge ad has the potential to improve bicycle travel as a bike pass are eventually developed on the west side, but it offers minimal or no short or long-term benefit for those who wish to access the river or the riverside from adjacent neighborhoods. Further, it creates an obstacle in the only uninterrupted two-mile stretch on this river. So in conclusion, uh, potential benefits of a new bridge at the proposed site seem questionable. However, if a bridge is to be built, it must conform to requirements for safe navigation, and this can only be accomplished by building a clear span with no support structures in the river. Now, numerous obstacles and objections to construction of a clear span have been described. If these obstacles cannot be overcome and objections satisfactorily addressed, then the bridge should not be built. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Herbers. Do, do uh, the commissioners have questions for Mr. Herbers? Any questions? Hearing, hearing none, we're going to move on. Thank you, Mr. Herbers, for your presentation. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Dennis Chestnut. Mr. Chestnut, you have three minutes to provide testimony. Let us know when you are ready. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Great. I am ready. Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Good Goodman and the N NCPC commissioners, and thank you for this opportunity to uh, give this testimony today uh, as it relates to this project. I will begin by recognizing uh, the Nacotchtank Algonquin people and their ancestral lands that we are currently uh, discussing. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing regarding this very important development and this very important asset and natural resource in our community. We have been improving the health of the Anacostia River for decades, have made tremendous progress and cannot go backward. My name is Dennis Chestnut. I am a native Washingtonian and lifetime resident of Ward 7. I have lived in my community, Hillbrook, for 75 years, this aligns my life and lived experience with some major developments that have impacted, um, impacted this community, the residents, and the quality of life for several decades. This far northeast part of Ward 7 that has the longest stretch of shoreline of the Anacostia River 
and the largest tributary to it, Watts Branch in Washington, D.C., has been dumped on literally since the 1940s with no citizen input. Some of the challenges to the community include the municipal landfill Kenilworth dump, uh, 1930 to 1970s, the Anacostia Freeway, 295, 1957 to 64, the many environmental justice conditions that exist because of the Pepco power plant on the banks of the Anacostia River and the CSX rail line. All these factors have created a very resilient and self-reliant community, and we're proud to be that. Now that development is coming to this community, it is most important that what is done is done right. The far northeast community of Ward 7 is blessed to have abundant green space, parkland, walking and biking trails, and the stream and the Anacostia River. It is time for the community and the residents of the district to have access to and benefit from uh, Kenworth Park as it is upgraded and restored. The community supports the Anacostia Riverwalk Trail extension and the Anacostia Bridge project with some recommended modifications and the Clearspan Bridge is one of those recommended modifications. The community and residents of these neighborhoods must benefit from and be centered in any decisions regarding what is built in Kenworth Park and this section of the Anacostia River. I thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chestnut, for your contributions. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Yes, Madam, Madam Chair. Yes, sir, Commissioner Dixon. I, I first of all want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Chestnut because he's uh, been in the trenches for many, many years. Uh, developing uh, activity around the Anacostia River. Uh, I had made contact with him oftentimes with the Anacostia Coordinating Council, which I shared for quite a while. Uh, and I also want to tell him that he is, in my mind, a member of the world of R, Anacostia River East. Uh, I think that uh, we live in a community which is bounded by one of the a very spiritual and special rivers. I also uh, support the concern that he raises, and it's been mentioned earlier, about the access to the river itself. And we don't want to just create what a, a needed biking and walking path through our community, but we need to also make sure that we create more access to the water itself. And I, I think that's consistent with what I've been hearing. So there's, I think that's being affected negatively, then I think we need to de definitely think seriously about that. Uh, so with that, I could say a lot more. I don't want to go on uh, because I've been a boater, too. I actually I sailed up that river as far as I could. But because of the uh, depth, uh, we were limited and you may be able to canoe, but uh, it's shallow. And that's a concern. Dredging may be helpful, but I'm not sure we can uh, do that at, at this time. Also, I've been a very I'm, I'm going to get back on my bike and maybe do some more walking with the, with this kind of expansion. But I don't think we should cut off the access to the water itself. And uh, that that that's very important. Thank you very much, Dennis, for all you've done. Uh, and you're highly respected in our community on all sides of the river for your efforts in these areas. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Dixon. Thank you very much. Any further comment? Thank you, Mr. Chestnut. We'll move along now to the next speaker, um, Ms. Cindy Cole with the Washington Rowing School. Ms. Cole, you have five minutes to provide your testimony. Let us know when you're ready. Good Are afternoon, you ready? and I am I am ready. Good afternoon, okay. and thank you for this to the commission, and thank you for this opportunity to uh, address uh, you and address this issue and this project. Um, many years ago, uh, up in Georgetown, Clyde's Restaurant proposed putting a barge in the river uh, and putting a restaurant on that, but the boating community objected, and. After much discussion, this project was not approved because it had interfered with travel patterns for the boating community, the rowers. Years later, 
um, more recently, the Kennedy Center proposed putting a dock in front of their facility to bring more patrons to their facility. Again, the boating community objected that this interfered with their traveling. Now, I understand how wide the, Anna, the Potomac River is there, how many arches there are on those bridges. There's lots of room. But they argued it interfered with the boating community and their travel patterns, and they succeeded. The project was remodified so that it all of their facility was on land. So why? They changed those projects and they were not approved. And yet for our river, we're gonna put a bridge across here with three cement pilings through the river and that's considered acceptable. Why? Because in Georgetown, boating is respected and valued. The Anacostia now is a rowing center. Over the years that this project has been discussed, rowing has grown on the Anacostia to, I estimate, at least maybe 2,000 rowers out of two boathouses. We have young, we have adults, we have paddlers, we have rowers. All the bridges present safety hazards. They're both, the boats, our boats run into them in spite of our best efforts. Um, so it's a danger to the equipment, it's a danger to the athletes. So this boat bridge will be no different. Right now we have people that come up our, to our part of the river because it's, it's an unusual area. We do learn to row. We have um, free clinics. We teach adults and kids down to, down to 10 years old to row. At the, our section of the river is quiet, uh, safe, and a, a respite from all the busyness that you find at other venues uh, in the area. So I, I and I applaud the, the cycling community for all the work they've done putting in cycling lanes uh, on roads in the area. But I, I hear that the through traffic being used to justify this bridge, we have alternatives in other bridges. We have lots of bridges and I think that's been recognized. There are lots of bridges across the Anacostia. We need to use those for the tr through traffic for cyclists. These, we need to protect our natural areas and keep them for pedestrians and local traffic uh, because it already, it, it interferes very much with the use of the river itself. So the question is, is the message here that we should if we want to boat, we should go over to the Potomac. This is economic injustice. We need boating to be available on our side of the city also. So we can do better than this. Let's be progressive and think of other ways other than cement and asphalt to put in our parks. We need access to the river we need natural surfaces. So I ask the commission to pause this project, reevaluate what it does to the river, the natural areas, and rather promote this area, not as a transportation pass through, but as a ju green jewel in DC's crown. A clear That's span bridge. That's Ms. Cole. A clear span bridge would address a lot of this. So, thank, thank you. Me. Thank you. Thanks for your participation, your contribution today, Ms. Cole. Any questions? Yes, Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Commissioner Dixon. I, I know this is going to be a long meeting, so I'm, I don't want to keep talking too much, but this touches me very much. First of all, I have uh, go back maybe a lot of years when we first got the kids from Ketchup Junior High School to, we actually paid for them, got resources in the bill called boats, rowboats. 
to go up and down the river when it wasn't in fad and actually got them into rowing classes so they could learn how to row and swim to start with. Uh, this goes back at least maybe 30, 40 years. So this has been around me for a long time. And uh, I would like to see uh, this kind of attention given that, that has been brought up about the, the real usefulness and, and facilitate the, the ability to use it as a rowing area and boating area. I don't think you can dredge it enough to ha handle my dagger board and my sailboat, but in my mast may be too tall, but these other boats can move through it with, with, if it's done properly. But thank you, the last witness. I thank her very much for her comments and I appreciate them. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Dixon. The um, eighth speaker today is Kelly Krampos, representing the Washington Area Cycle Bicyclist Association. And you have um, five minutes to provide your testimony and let us know when you're ready. You're ready. Right. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. Thank you for coming. Go ahead. Chair Goodman and Commission members, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. I'm pleased to comment on behalf of the Washington Area Bicyclist Association, or WABA. Our mission is to empower people to ride bikes, build connections, and transform places. We envision a just, equitable transportation system where walking, biking, and transit are the best ways to get around. We believe that the Arboretum Bridge and Trail Project improves equitable transportation options for community members while also bringing many benefits to the region. The clearest benefit is an improved connection. The bridge will improve transportation options for community members, especially in DC's wards five and seven, by creating a more convenient direct route that supports people getting around without a personal vehicle. As you well know, currently to cross the Anacostia River, people must travel from the Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens either one and a half miles south to Benning Road or two and a half miles north to the pedestrian bridge at Bladensburg Waterfront Park. These distances can make it difficult for residents of Eastland Gardens, Kenilworth, or Deanwood to walk or bike to get across the Anacostia River by adding distances and time that can make the trip impractical and undesirable. Because of the connection, the project will improve safer, sustainable transportation for people walking, rolling, and biking. This is crucial in the broader context of increasing traffic violence across DC. In 2023, DC experienced 52 traffic deaths, a 16-year high. That was 17 more fatalities than in 2022, and it was twice the number of deaths in 2014. The need for improved safety for all road users is especially crucial in several communities that will be most directly impacted by the Arboretum Bridge and Trail Project. DC reports that wards five, seven, and eight had the highest instances of reported traffic fatalities and injuries between 2017 to 2021. In 2023, in Ward 7, 11 people were killed in traffic-related in incidences, including five pedestrians, a bicyclist, and a scooter rider. In Ward 5, 11 other people were killed, including five pedestrians. A particular note, in 2023, three pedestrians were killed along Benning Road, which is one of the primary river crossings currently available for the impacted neighborhoods. Additionally, households in Ward 7 and 8 had the highest rates of households in DC who live without access to a car. Whether it's by choice or by necessity, riding a bike or walking for transportation should be accessible and inexpensive ways to get around, and it should be safer to do so. Next, the project fills a critical gap in the region's trail network. The Arboretum Bridge and Trail Project, as you know, is identified as a key segment of the Anacostia River Trail Network and was included as a component of the Anacostia Waterfront Initiative more than 20 years ago. This project will help also connect to the broader capital trail network that includes 1,000 miles of existing and planned trails across Northern Virginia, DC, and the surrounding counties in Maryland. We encourage DDOT to proceed with additional trail connections through neighborhoods to the trails, including the trail project from the Arboretum Gate to Maryland Avenue Northeast, which will add critical connectivity when the Arboretum is closed, the New York Avenue Northeast Trail, and other important on-street multimodal safety improvements. The project also improves access to natural and cultural resources. The bridge and trail will be ADA compliant, which will allow DC residents and visitors of all ages and abilities to enjoy some of our most celebrated natural and cultural resources, such as the National Arboretum, Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens, Anacostia Park, and the Anacostia River itself in a low impact way. Finally, as you've acknowledged, the bridge has community support from community members, from advisory neighborhood commissions, and the DC Council. Starting back in 2000, more than 5,000 DC citizens and Anacostia River stakeholders helped inform the Anacostia Waterfront Initiative, 
before it was launched in 2003. More recently, from 2019 to 2024, several ANC neighborhood commissions, ANC 7D, 5C, and 5D, have submitted letters in support of the project. DDOT's 2019 meeting record indicates that of the stakeholder feedback they received, 347 people expressed support for the project compared to 112 people who opposed it. Um, even more recently, in 2023 to 2024, just through WABA supported outreach, more than 300 comments from community members were submitted about the project, emphasizing the importance of that connection. In closing, the Arboretum Bridge and Trail Project promotes a more livable, better connected region by promoting bicycling for affordable and sustainable transportation and for fun and fitness. We fully support the project and encourage the commission to move forward without delay. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, Ms. Krampus, and thank you for your presentation today. Are there any questions for the speaker today? Any questions? Well, hearing none, thank you again. And our next speaker is Mr. Dan Smith with Friends of Lower Beaver Dam Creek. Uh, Mr. Smith, you have five minutes. Are you present? Mr. Smith? Uh, Mr. Smith, if we don't hear from you. Sure. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. I uh, had not unmuted. I apologize. That's okay. No worries. Welcome. Dan, thank you. Dan Smith, um, founding member and current president of Friends of Lower Beaver Dam Creek, a group we started 20 years ago to help clean up the most polluted subwatershed of the Anacostia, immediately upstream from uh, the area in question here. And I just would like to say at the outset that I believe a clear span bridge would be consistent and satisfy everything that was just said in the uh, previous presentation from uh, the bicycle uh, representative. Um, I would like to say that uh, though, that I believe the concerns here over this segment of the river walk trail uh, aren't a concern. It's not opposition to the Riverwalk Trail system. It's to one segment. So I would just like to caution us in the repeated presentation or the repeated um, staff reference to plans that we're just carrying out and following through on and implementing. 21 years ago, yeah, great concept. There's some amazing things that have been established with that. Yet, as we get along 20 years later, it's appropriate to look at some of the final segments to see if we can tweak them, change them, improve them. Um, so I urge looking at it in that light. With the clear span bridge, I would also like to ask the staff if they, uh, later in the discussion, if they can pull up again the profiles of the clear span bridge. While this was going on, I just looked at the um, photograph online of the bridge over the water, uh, the river at the Waterfront Park in Bladensburg, that profile is not nearly as high as it appeared to be from those that were the design considerations that were presented earlier in this presentation. The other thing that disappoints me is that the almost entire absence in the presentation and evaluation of the, nat the special natural character and quality of this segment of the river. In one of my previous lives at uh, Casey Trees or American Forest, we were involved with a, a major event and announcement. I think it was Mayor Gray. And he was announcing a new cleanup phase down on the river at the, at, uh, at the boat dock. And he, he, he paused in the middle of his prepared remarks. He looked into the sky and he said, have you ever been on the river right up there, just around the corner? It is amazing. The city environment drops away. It's like being in West Virginia. Well, I grew up in Montana and I relish my time in these natural areas of the Anacostia. And I want, and I want us to appreciate how much they're improving and how much those are assets 
that we, we want to have that, the highest quality of interaction and character and equitable access to those qualities. So let's enhance and build on, on the qualities that we've got, which also are gonna have very measurable and important benefits for climate change mitigation in the city. So I know that's not this discussion, but please as a commission going forward, look at the entire Anacostia system the entire thing and all the, the ways that the water mitigation, the climate, the, the heat island can be used as a tool to protect the federal city assets. So uh, I just would, in closing, we applaud much of the trail development along the river and understand the frustration and how slow it's been at times. This, that is not a reason for pausing now to ensure that the future trail and bridge construction is done in concert with overall planning. And at this time, because this segment is, it's okay, it, 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 it's an important connection for many people to the Arboretum, but it is not at all gonna be address any of the through traffic or the larger questions that uh, many people have addressed earlier. So a little bit of a pause is still is appropriate and is not that disruptive to uh, ensuring we do it right. So thanks very much for your consideration. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. And um, we're grateful for your participation. Are there any questions for Mr. Smith? Any commissioners have questions? Thank you, then moving on. Our next person signed up to speak is Sheena Foster with the Friends of Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens, and you will have five minutes to present your testimony. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. All right, excellent. <sighs> so good afternoon, uh, Chair Goodman and commission members. My name is Sheena Foster and I am the executive director. Um, well, as the executive director, I am pleased to uh, submit comments on behalf of Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens in regards to the uh, Arboretum Bridge and Trail Project. Um, I'd like to point out that I have a, over a 20 year history with the National Park Service starting in Alaska all the way to Virginia. And I hold a degree in urban sustainability and environmental studies um, and have experiences and expertise um, to understand the environmental, social and economic impact of this project. And I have a keen interest in equitable, equitable development. Uh, Friends of Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens was founded in 2007 by a small group of uh, volunteers enthralled by the park's unique beauty and place in DC history. We work in cooperation with the National Park Service to ensure that the park is well maintained, well enjoyed and welcoming for all neighbors and visitors. Friends of Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens is a nonprofit organization that connects people to the park through stewardship, engagement, and educational programs. We support the bridge and trail project because it will improve access to Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens in many ways and will help advance our mission to connect people to the park through stewardship, engagement, and education. The project will drive visitation to Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens and provide a physical connection between two of DC's most cherished but lesser known natural places, as well as connect, connect neighborhoods. Lastly, it will enable us to tell a more comprehensive story of the relationship of the Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens and nearby communities with the Anacostia River and will inspire more people to explore and steward the park and the surrounding area. As an official partner of the National Capital Parks East, for more than 10 years, we are confident that DDOT, DC Department of Transportation, and the National Park Service will and continue to ensure protection of the resources while balancing visitor use. This project is directly in line with the National Park Service's goal of extending the benefits of natural and cultural resource conservation and outdoor recreation. This bridge connection will connect people, build community, and inspire a deeper connection with the environment. The Anacostia River between Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens and the National Arboretum is a barrier to the aquatic gardens and for community members. We have a unique opportunity to bridge the gap. 
which will in turn provide more opportunities for li those living on both sides of the river that walk and bike to explore their surroundings and get to where they need to go safely. The Arboretum Bridge Project is a great example of infrastructure that encourages positive use, drives visitation, and inspires, excuse me, I'm sorry, inspires people to care about and care for their environment. We support the Arboretum Bridge, the Trail Project and Trail Project and encourage the National Capital Planning Commission to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Foster. We appreciate your participation today. Any questions? Any questions for Ms. Foster? Hearing none, we'll move along. Thank you again. Our next speaker is um, Mr. Michael Hodas with City Interest Development Partners. And Mr. Hodas, you have five minutes. Are uh, you prepared? So there I'm you ready. are. Well, thank you so um, much. Uh, thank you. So City Interest Development Partners uh, is the owner and master developer of the Parkside PUD, uh, which we have owned since 2004. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, the Parkside P PUD is the largest transit-oriented transit. PUD in the city of, uh, of Washington. Uh, we're entitled for 3.1 million square feet of development, uh, which we have built uh, or are under construction on 1.5 million square feet, and we've got uh, an additional 1.6 million square feet uh, that will come in the next several years. Uh, Parkside boasts four schools, ranging from uh, literally birth through the age of 18, where you can go to school. We've got affordable workforce and market rate housing. Uh, we have for sale housing. We have a primary care clinic and a community park. Uh, we are introducing our first retail at Parkside uh, this year with uh, additional retail to follow in pretty much every building that we're going to be doing. Since 2004, when we purchased Parkside, uh, the changes to the east end of Washington have been dramatic. Uh, but perhaps the single greatest change is uh, Parkside has gone from a desert to a community that's connected by additional roads, uh, by access points off of 295, by a brand new pedestrian bridge to uh, the Minnesota Avenue Metro Station and the Anacostia Waterfront Trail. Uh, we soon expect DDOT to begin work connecting Anacostia Avenue and Foot Street in the neighborhood to Benning Road, which will enhance additional access not only for residents and retailers, but also emergency vehicles. So these connections ha have done uh, a lot to bring children to the schools at Parkside, to bring new renters to multifamily projects, to bring seniors to our senior housing, and to bring homeowners to our, our for sale projects. Uh, and despite all this progress, we recognize that additional ingress, egress, and meaningful connections across the Anacostia will only continue to strengthen communities east of the river, which have been the victims of disinvestment for generations. Uh, you can see it in things streetcar, which has been delayed. Uh, they built the, the uh, area west of the river. The connection as it moves across the river is now delayed at least two years and, and potentially indefinitely. So uh, the offshoot of the hiker biker trail here, the proposed bridge will provide even greater access for recreation and, enjoy and, and enjoyment. Uh, I implore you all to support the bridge project as I'm testifying to the radiating effect that connections such as this bridge have on the thousands of residents that are already at Parkside and in adjacent communities such as Mayfair, Eastland Gardens, uh, and, and Kenilworth, and the- That's five minutes, sir. Uh, forward, so thank you. You're muted, muted Madam Chair. <laughs> My apologies. Thank you, Mr. Hodes. We really do appreciate your comments today. Thank you for your contribution. Any questions for Mr. Hodes? Hearing none, we're going to move along. Thank you. This next speaker is um, Mr. Daniel Riffle. And Mr. Daniel Riffle, you have three minutes. Welcome to the NCPC. Are you ready? I believe Mr. Riffle had to step away. So he noted that the 
commissioners had his testimony. It's also on the NCPC website. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Coster. Then we'll move on to Mr. Max Ewert. And Mr. Ewert, you have three minutes. Are you here? Um, yes, I'm here. And uh, I have to use my phone, so I apologize if I'm uh, moving okay. a little bit on doing my testimony. Um, good afternoon. My name is Max Ewert. I am a lifelong DC resident and frequent user of the Arbor, frequent lover, lover and frequent user of the Arboretum, Anacostia River Trail, and the Anacostia River. And for my day job, I work as a park planner for Arlington County um, Department of Parks and Recreation. Today, I am speaking in favor of the proposed pedestrian bridge and trail extension. Part of the reason I got the job I have is because of the work I did on my master's thesis, researching the public health benefits of parks and how the inequitable access to parks exacerbates the impact of these public health outcomes. While parks are wonderful marvels in their own right, research shows that frequent park users are more likely to have lower blood pressure, lower rates of asthma, and lower rates of obesity. Public health outcomes that disproportionately impact non-white and specifically black communities when considering the context of, this of the surrounding neighborhoods. These benefits are particularly prominent in certain park typologies. The Arboretum, a larger, more natural park, is particularly adept at providing benefits that mitigate the impacts of these public health outcomes. At the end of the written testimony, I have provided maps showing the prevalence of these public health outcomes throughout the Washington, D.C. Um, area. Uh, spoiler for those who are only listening, communities east of the river have dis disproportionately higher rates of obesity, asthma, and high now that we have established why it is important for people to go to parks, let's address the much more difficult task of why do white people go to parks at a higher rate than non-white people. History plays a role. In many Southern communities during segregation, black people were not allowed to go to certain parks. When the biggest indicator of whether or not someone goes to a park is that their parents frequently go to parks, it's impossible to ignore the role segregation played in this. Another reason people do not go to parks is that there is a mismatch in preferred activities and available activities. Research shows that different communities recreate differently. It is important that parks are able to be flexible in how people play and learn to appeal to all groups. And the largest indicator that someone won't go to a park is that it is too difficult to get to. If you live on Kenilworth Ter Terrace in the Mayfield neighborhood near the Minnesota Avenue Metro Station, it would take about 20 minutes by car and 45 minutes by public transportation to get to the Arboretum. Alternatively, alternatively, if this bridge is built, it is a 10 minute bike ride that is 100% in protected bike lanes or trails. When I was researching my thesis, one of my favorite things that I learned was that the more frequently one attends a park, the more likely they are to be a better steward for the park. I guarantee that I'm not the only person here who has spent a Saturday morning dragging tires and shopping carts out of the Anacostia River. If making the river and Arboretum more accessible to communities, who were never given a sense of ownership over these places could also improve the health of the river and surrounding natural area, as well as all of the established health benefits that would come with it, it would be irresponsible not to approve the construction of this pedestrian bridge. Additionally, to my NPS colleagues, I urge you not, sorry, I urge you not to stop here. Go to the schools east of the river and invite the kids lovingly to the Anacostia, its surrounding environs, and the Arboretum. Be intentional about increasing the access to this beautiful resource. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate your comments, Mr. Ewert, and very valuable comments indeed. And uh, are there any questions for Mr. Ewert? Hearing none, our next speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Ewert. Our next speaker is Mr. Corey Holman. Hi. It? Okay. Yep. Yes. Are, are you prepared? Okay. Very good. Yes. Thank you for joining us today. Hi. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson uh, Goodman and Commissioners. Um, you've heard all about the technical aspects and history and threats to current uses and benefits of connectivity. Uh, my name is Corey Holman, resident of Hill East and former ANC commissioner, and I just want to share my story on why this project matters. Um, at the start of the pandemic, my family and I sought out outdoor recreation activities. Living near the Anacostia, Anacostia we immediately found that along the river. In the years since, my son has went from training wheels in the RFK parking lot to confidently biking the 13 miles to Lake Artemisia. My daughter has gone from crawling to loving walks in the Arboretum especially spending time at what she lovingly calls the beach, which is the riverside portion outside the gates uh, right where near this bridge will go. Um, we've turned into a birding family thanks to the opportunities provided up and down the river and our children's fascination with birds. Uh, the Anacostia is an unending source of joy for us. It's fostered a sense of discovery and wonder in my children. It's been a major source of active recreation and the benefits that come from that. Quite simply, the pandemic since the pandemic, the river, the Arboretum, Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens, the ART, Bladensburg Park, 
Lake Artemisia, and so much more have become parts of our family. We are eternally thankful for the foresight of this commission and so many other organizations here and elsewhere that have, pl have played in creating these opportunities. We cannot forget the progress uh, that has been made in the last 50 years. Uh, it's through this lens I speak wholeheartedly in support of the Arboretum Bridge Project. This joy should be available to more users. Every time we spend an afternoon in the Arboretum, awed by the uh, tree diversity, every time we're wowed by the beauty of the lilies at the aquatic gardens, every time we stare and wonder at, at the flight of a heron, all of these moments, I just wish more people were there to share in them. Um, and this bridge simply increases those opportunities. Um, with that, I just want to thank you for your service to, to the district and the National Capital Region, and I'm here for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Holman. We appreciate your remarks and uh, your input. Uh, any questions for Mr. Holman? Any questions? Hearing none, thank you again. And we're moving on to uh, next we have Mr. Uh, I believe is it Kai uh, Hall with the DC Transportation Equity Network. You have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Goodman and members of the commission. My name is Kai Hall, and I'm the coordinator of the DC Transportation Equity Network, also called the DC-10. The DC-10 is a coalition of direct service and advocacy organizations committed to seeing a complete transportation system that accounts for vulnerable residents pushed to the margins of our thriving city. Our members include Greater Greater Washington, so others might eat, the Washington Area Bicyclists Association, DC Families for Safe Streets, MedStar Washington Hospital Center, Disability Rights DC, uh, HIPS, just to name a few. I'm testifying on behalf of the DC-10 in support of moving forward with the construction of the National Arboretum Access Bridge. With over 600,000 visitors per year, the National Arboretum is a beloved destination in the district. Not only does it serve as an important site for research, but it also provides ample opportunities for recreation. Unfortunately, it's difficult to access the Arboretum and all of the educational and recreational amenities it provides without driving to it. Currently, there are no convenient and direct connections to the National Arboretum and the neighborhoods around it for residents who live just across the Anacostia River in the Kenilworth, Eastland Gardens, and Mayfair neighborhoods, though they are less than a mile away. Based on data from the American Community Survey, upwards of 54.7% of households in some of these neighborhoods do not own a car. To visit the Arboretum and amenities on the west side of the Anacostia River without a car, mm -hmm. Many of the nearly 6,500 residents of these three neighborhoods currently have to choose between walking for over an hour along dangerous tier one roads as classified by the district's high injury network corridors, taking two buses or taking a combination of Metro rail and bus. Excuse me one second. These neighborhoods also experience disproportionate rates of asthma caused by poor air quality from car exhaust and traffic violence. For such a remarkable amenity like the Arboretum and the adjacent Anacostia River, the lack of connectivity for nearby residents is a barrier for equitable enjoyment of these national gems and the green spaces they provide. By approving the National Arboretum Access Bridge design, the Commission will make it possible for those who live in Mayfair, Kenilworth, and Eastland Gardens to more easily access the green space river amenities and educational opportunities that the Arboretum provides. Because the proposed design for the bridge centers people over cars, this project would signal not only to residents of these neighborhoods, but also to the majority of DC residents and visitors who don't, can't, or only occasionally drive, that the enjoyment of the Anacostia River and the National Arboretum is not contingent on whether or not one has a car. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it, Mr. Hall. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Hall? Hearing none, we'll move on. Uh, next, we have um, number 16 is Ms. Laura Miller Brooks with the Capital Trails Coalition. And uh, Ms. Brooks, you have five minutes to provide testimony. Thank you for coming today to contribute to the conversation. Um, well, th well, thank you, uh, Chair Goodman and Commission members. Can you hear me? Yes, all good. Okay, great. My name is Laura Miller Brooks, and I am the director of the transportation and uh, director of transportation and infrastructure for the Federal C City Council. And I also have the honor of serving as chair of the Capital Trails Coalition Steering Committee. Um, and on behalf of the Capital Trails Coalition, I am pleased to submit comments in support of the Arboretum Bridge. Uh, and 
uh, trail extension projects. So the CTC was founded by the National Park Service, Rails to Trails Conservancy, and Washington Area Bicyclists Association nearly a decade ago to bring together the broad, diverse set of decision makers, stakeholders, and agency officials who are responsible for a region's trail system. The CTC's goal is to coordinate, communicate, and collaborate as a singular en entity advocating for the completion of a network of more than 1,000 miles of trails across Prince George's and Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, the District of Columbia, and Northern Virginia. Today, the coalition is made up of more than 80 member organizations, including government agencies, businesses, and community groups working to realize this vision of an equitable, connected, and low-stress multi-use net trail network that will transform public life by providing access to open space and reliable transportation for people of all ages and abilities. The CTC has supported the bridge and trail project as part of the Anacostia River Trail since its inception in local planning documents. We applaud the NPS's coordination with the District Department of Transportation and the National Arboretum, as well as the project team's focus on considering community input, including the thousands of stakeholders engaged around the water, uh, the Anacostia Waterfront Initiative and hundreds of people engaged through DDOT's public engagement efforts. The benefits of the Arb Arboretum Bridge uh, and Trail Project are numerous, the con uh, and connection is the main focus of this project. As many folks noted, currently to cross, uh, cross the river without this bridge, people have to travel um, uh, to Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens, either 1.5 miles south or uh, to Benning Road or 2.5 miles north to the pedestrian bridge at Bladensburg Waterfront Park. These distances make it impractical and difficult for residents of Eastland Gardens, Kenilworth, or Deanwood to walk or bike across the Anacostia River. If an individual is traveling in a personal vehicle, those distances might just add a few minutes to their trip. But as my last uh, colleague or, or speaker noted, the, um, you know, if that individual is traveling by foot or bike, that, that time and distance can not only be uh, insurmountable in terms of time, but it can also be dangerous. Trail mm -hmm. user data shows that hundreds of people already use the Anacostia River Trail today. At the Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens, about 350 people are recorded on the trail on an average weekday, and nearly 700, 698 were that's counts, um, are there on each weekend day. There was a peak of 1,703 people using the trail on a Saturday in November 22. At Dean Avenue, nearly 300 people are recorded on the trail on an average weekday with an average of 535 people each weekend day. Um, again, a uh, November Saturday peak with more than 1,500 people. So I believe, um, you know, as core to the, the coalition's priorities of connectivity of the network, we know that improved safety and convenience and trail connections will not only increase the number of trail users, but also the frequency of which those users, even those using it today, um, can use and enjoy the trail. This project will also give residents more direct access to some of the most celebrated natural and cultural resources in our city, Anacostia River, Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens, and the U.S. Arboretum. This improved access will also allow um, more engagement with neighbors and the national park sites along the, along the river and trail network. The CTC applauds the leadership of NPS in helping coordinate and win a $25 million raise grant uh, to seven a million, which will be able to catalyze this project. Um, and we hope that NCPC will approve this project so those funds may be utilized on the appropriate budget cycle and timeline. We are encouraged that DDOT is already moving forward with connections beyond the Arboretum Gate, such as the Arboretum Bridge to Maryland Avenue Northeast Project, to ensure that trail users will not be constrained by the operating hours of the Arboretum. Ensuring accessibility to the bridge is vital to maximizing impact for residents and visitors. And we encourage NPS to work with DDOT to pursue similar enhancements to lighting, signage, and hours of access, similar what uh, to what was done on the Zoo Loop Trail in Rock Creek Park and other NPS properties to enhance that experience for all users. Multi-use trails are a critical part of the livability and attractiveness of our region. They encourage active transportation, improve residents' health, and expire connection. Thank you for your consideration.
Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Miller Brooks. We appreciate your contributions today. Any commissioner questions for Ms. Miller Brooks? Any questions? Hearing none, then thank you very much. We appreciate your input. And we will now um, have speaker Trey Sherrard. Um, Mr. Sherrard, are you prepared? Ready to go? Great. We can see you. Great. Go for it. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you. So my name is Trey Sherrard. I am the Anacostia Riverkeeper at Anacostia Riverkeeper. I am also a cyclist, um, not a, a go crazy, do laps one, but a definitely a utilitarian cyclist on the trail in particular. So these these issues on both sides are are complicated for me already. I am a Ward 7 resident. I currently rent in Kingman Park and have been here for seven years. Uh, I access the Arboretum a lot, and I know exactly how dangerous and how scary uh, Bladensburg Road is. Uh, I know that the sidewalk there is not in good shape. And so I, I understand the desire personally to, to have better, safer access to the Arboretum. I do not think this bridge is the appropriate way to do that. I do not think that personally, I also do not think that in my professional role as the Anacostia Riverkeeper, nor in my role as the DC Vice Chair for the AUCAC, nor in my role as a member of the Mayor's Leadership Council for the Cleaner Anacostia River. We've been involved in this project for five years at this point. The Anacostia Riverkeeper came in in 2019 at the 30% design phase. Uh, and what should be embarrassing, but is all too common, I fear, at 30% design, after several years of design work by I don't know how many contractors and at least two agencies, National Park Service and the District Department of Transportation, no single member of the design team had ever viewed the site by a boat. They were designing a bridge to cross the Anacostia River, and no one in several years of design thought, gee, maybe we should look at it from the water. Uh, they have literally never taken that perspective into the design process. At 30% design, the design that was given to us was pretty fully baked. They offered us some options about what colors, what shapes, what sizes, but nothing meaningful. And that is the kind of check the box outreach that is way too common for projects at the large scale, but especially for projects around the Anacostia River, and in particular for projects in Ward 7 and Ward 8. At 30% design, the public was led to believe that this bridge would bring improved emergency access as a major benefit to the neighborhoods via having ambulances be able to cross it. Uh, disregarding the problems of gates closed at night and sometimes not opened, as in my personal experience for cleanups many Saturday mornings at Kenilworth Park. Hopefully that goes away with the shift in management by the district instead of park service. There's no egress on the other side. There is no designed trail yet on the Arboretum side. The Arboretum is a dead end after 4.30 p.m. every day of the week when the gates close down to the river access and until 8.30 a.m. in the morning. Uh, we take great issue with the, the ideas that this is going to be some big commuter benefit. Uh, that's, that's years away when the bridge is being rushed ahead of the trail connections on both sides. Now, at 60% design, we have been led to believe that the, the design was changed to no longer accommodate the full weight of an ambulance, but instead something more like a, a gator, like a golf cart size and weight four or six wheel utility vehicle or UTV. Uh, that's a good change in my mind. Uh, that means that maybe we need to have less materials and the design can be less visually intrusive than what has been presented so far. Uh, but we haven't seen those changes. And I have open questions for the design team and maybe the commissioners have this knowledge, perhaps not. Uh, I don't know what the current design parameter is for this bridge. It has been five years since the public heard anything about the design and the outreach last summer was strictly a single virtual meeting despite multiple requests by multiple organizations and many individuals, many of whom from whom you have heard on this meeting today for an extension on public comment, which was flatly refused. My first time having that flatly refused on the first ask in 12 years of this work at local, state and national levels. And the meeting 
the agencies and their contractors insisted that a single virtual meeting would be sufficient. I'm going to come back to some other issues, but before I run out of time, and I would like a time check, please, I wanted to bring up an episode from the 60% design virtual meeting. At about the one hour mark into a two hour meeting, we had gotten out of the presentation by the agencies and we're starting to enter questions and answer session. A, a gentleman who is a, a well-known former ANC and or civic association leader from Ward 8, uh, an older gentleman of color with whom I've, I've had a lot of interactions both in person and virtually in, in a decade of work here, he had trouble getting into the meeting and he clearly stated that when he was granted the opportunity to speak. He went on to very clearly state that many of his neighbors, his community east of the river, who he knew intended to attend that meeting, were not there and that they were texting back and forth. They were also having technical issues. These are not all people who have not used the platform before, right? There were just technical issues with that meeting in particular. He you are at five minutes now. Thank you. He then very clearly asked for DDOT and Park Service to please host a ver an in-person meeting or two in his community so that the people he knew were not being hear heard from could actually comment. The response to that, which I think sums up this entire process of 60% design as a case in point, was we'll send you the recording. Thank you very much for your input. <clears throat> This it been it's valuable input and we appreciate it, Mr. Sherrard. Any questions from commissioners for Mr. Sherrard? Any questions? Hearing none, we want to thank you today for contributing to this uh, conversation. Um, to the next speaker, uh, and I believe it is our last speaker, unless Ms. Coster has someone else, is Mr. Adam. Crone, or is it Crone? Uh, Crone, thank you. Crone, okay, Mr. Adam Crone with the DC Audubon Society, and you have five minutes as you're representing an organization. Thank you for your patience. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Adam Crone. I'm secretary of the DC Audubon Society. Uh, at the outset, I want to note that uh, DC Audubon is supportive of the objective of this project to provide a safe and convenient, safe and convenient means to access the Anacostia waterfront. One of the primary goals of DC Audubon is to connect, to connect district residents with nature and to connect communities through birding and other shared interests. Our main concern with this project is with its environmental analysis, specifically the environmental assessment completed in 2011. I'm here today to ask that the commission not approve of the project as currently proposed, but rather send it back with instructions to complete a new or supplemental environmental assessment. First, it's, no, it's important to note why this matters. The proposed bridge will connect Kenilworth Park with the Arboretum. Together with Kingman Island, these three areas form one of the largest blocks of habitat in the district. As of 2023, there have been over 250 bird species observed in Kenilworth. The area also has the bulk of the district's wetland and grassland habitats, and it's the only stretch of the Anacostia in the district on which no major infrastructure can be seen. As currently proposed, the bridge would fall roughly in the center of this block of habitat and bisect this stretch of the Anacostia. For this reason, it's, it's critical that we get this right. That this project, along with its impacts, benefits, and alternatives are evaluated and decided properly and accurately. A primary issue with environmental assessment is that it's considerably outdated at this point. It was completed more than 12 years ago in 2011. As a general rule of thumb, environmental assessments are stale when they're five or more years old. We raised this issue in our 2019 comments when the environmental assessment was only nearing on eight years old and pointed to a particular problem of outdated assessments. They don't properly evaluate current cumulative impacts because they're set well in the past. A number of projects on and around the project site had been proposed by 2019, and there are more as of 2024. The environmental assessment does not and cannot consider their cumulative impacts. We also pointed out the requirement in the National Park Service's NEPA handbook, which directs NPS to complete a memo to file when the environmental analysis may be outdated. This is meant to be a serious inquiry as to the adequacy of the analysis. 
While NPS did complete such a memo in 2020, this fell into the category of more of an administrative exercise than a serious inquiry. The memo brushed off several related projects and entirely ignored others, such as the Anacostia Sediment Removal Project and redevelopment of Kenilworth. What's particularly unfortunate now is that there's been plenty of time for the project team to complete a new or supplemental environmental assessment in the four years since then, but they've opted to stick with a now cons considerably and certainly outdated document. A second major problem is the environmental assessments alternatives analysis. This is the heart of the NEPA analysis. It's, and in this case, essentially there isn't one. The environmental assessment only considers the proposed project and a no action alternative. One of the requirements of NEPA is to consider a reasonable range of alternatives. While this is open to legal interpretation, it's clear that just the preferred action and no action is not a reasonable range. The alternatives analysis does not include any other locations or any alternative designs at the bridge, even though there are many alternatives that would meet the purpose and need of this project. We pointed to a number of alternatives in our 2019 comments, including retrofitting the existing New York Avenue or Benning Road bridges, routing a shorter bridge from around the Pepco station uh, at the, uh, north of Benning Road to the Langston Golf Course and there to the Arboretum, and moving the terminus of the bridge to a location that's not affected by the closed Arboretum gates at 5 p.m. To this last point, others have spoken, uh, have spoken to this already, but the terminus at the locked gates is something that commenters have raised repeatedly, and the, co the project team has yet to offer a good response to this issue, only pointing to a new phase sometime in the future. But how can we make a proper decision now if we're only looking at a segment of the project and aren't evaluating what's next? If there are issues with the next phase where it never comes to pass, it will be too late. The bridge will already be constructed at that terminus. So I'll close by saying, we want the project team to succeed. The objective is an important one and the issues involved are serious ones. But the 2011 environmental assessment and decisions based on it are not sufficient. I urge the commission to deny the project as proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crone. I appreciate your input. Any questions from the commission? Any questions? Hearing none, I misspoke. We do have one additional speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Crone, for your valuable input. And we're moving on to uh, Ms. Brooke Bernold uh, with the Ward 5 Family Biking uh, Group, and you have five minutes to provide testimony. Thank you for your patience and for the confusion. Thank you. No problem. Chair Goodman and Commissioner mem and Commission members, my name is Brooke Bernald and I have lived in the Edgewood, Brooklyn area for over six years. And I am a proud 40 year resident of the District of Columbia. I'm the organizer or one of the organizers of the Ward 5 Family Biking Group. And I'm here to speak in support, emphatic support of the Arboretum Bridge and Trail Project. Ward 5 Family Biking is an effort we developed to support families to build community and to make family biking more accessible in Ward 5 and across the district. We advocate for improved street safety infrastructure to make our streets safer for everyone, especially for people walking and biking. Our recent rides have turned out hundreds of participants, ranging from toddlers on cargo bikes to elementary school students scooting or pedaling on their own, to parents and other community members. We have seen firsthand how these efforts create a safe space for family bike riding and can build community, empower people, and help residents understand just how desperately we need to improve the safety of our streets. Ward 5 Family Biking hosts rides that are designed to be inclusive of all ages and abilities. They're usually a slow roll, they're just a few miles, but everyone has joined. They can tell you they're filled with joy, laughter, and some questionably fun music. However, in Ward 5, we have to work with the local police for an escort and volunteer marshals to block streets to ensure our youngest riders and less confident riders have a safe place to ride and learn. We shouldn't need a police escort. I shouldn't need flashing lights, volunteers, and a massive crowd of participants to make our community safe for children. Ward 5 Family Biking enthusiastically supports the bridge and trail project because it creates a safe, low-stress, 
convenient connection for all residents of all skill levels to be able to travel across the district. The Arboretum Bridge and Trail Project will give our neighbors in Ward 5 and 7 other and other trail users a safe, more convenient route to access the natural and cultural resources that we have talked about on this panel today. The Arboretum, Kennel with Aquatic Gardens, Anacostia Park, the Bidgeon Trail adds more direct connections, shortening trips for residents of many Ward 7 neighborhoods and other points of interest across the Anacostia River as well. But contrary to Cindy Cole's testimony, those trips would otherwise be added miles and miles to get to the next closest correction, connection of Anacostia River crossings at Benning Road or Blatonsburg Waterfront Park. We are excited to support this because of the preliminary plans from DDOT to develop and fully integrate into the local network of multi-use trails, including Maryland Avenue Northeast to access the Arboretum outside of hours of its current limited operating hours and the New York Avenue Trail that would ensure a connection back to the Metro Branch Trail. These trail projects would ensure that Ward 5 residents and Ward 7 residents of all ages and ability can get around more safely and sustainably. As a Ward 5 resident and a daily user of the Met Branch Trail, I know from firsthand how multi-use trails for walking, biking, rolling, strolling, what have you, can become an invaluable manner of transport in your area. Anyone that has been in Edgewood, Brooklyn, Noma, Fort Totten areas at any time of day or night can attest to what a community point the Metro Branch Trail has become and how it is integral for transportation in this area. The Arboretum Bridge Trail offers the same type of connectivity that did the Met Branch Trail. It allows Ward 7 and other DC residents a car free, safe from traffic violence, crossing and access to our natural gems. As traffic fatalities and traffic violence are up 600% in January 2024, as compared to the previous January, we need safe passage now. We urge the National Capital Planning Commission to approve the Arboretum Bridge Trail to further expand our safe transport network and access to our natural resources. Thank you. And thank you very much, Ms. Bernal. Do we have any uh, questions from the commissioners? For Ms. Bernal, any questions? Hearing none, um, we want to thank you very, very much for coming and participating and sharing your perspective on this project. And then uh, we will conclude public testimony at this point. Uh, I just want to say again, we've received, um, you know, well over 65 uh, comments, um, the um, the support uh, versus um a lack of support is about 50-50 at this point, unless staff have received more uh, more comments um, over the course of this meeting. Um, so we, we've heard from a lot of different perspectives and those uh, in favor and those opposed. So I want to now uh, ask for a, a, a motion to approve the preliminary and final site development plans for the Anacostia Riverwalk Trail Extension and National Arboretum Access Bridge. Is there a motion? So moved. Um, thank you. Commissioner Sidham, is there a second? Second. second. Okay, there is a motion and a second. I'm not sure who seconded that. Commissioner Wright. Commissioner Wright, Wait. thank you. And so now it's open, we're open for discussion. I'd like everyone to turn on your cameras. I think everyone has. And what we will do is um, use our round robin um, uh, process. Uh, to deliberate on this issue. And uh, comments will begin with Commissioner Dixon, if you could please share your comments. Well, this is one I was hoping I'd be towards the end. Uh, <laughs> I, I will tell you, I'll tell you right now, I, I cannot support the project. Uh, and uh, it's not, not uh, consistent with my behavior on this commission to do this. But first of all, when I heard that my residents of our Anacostia River East got a video clip of, of, a, of a presentation that they weren't involved in and able to speak to, uh, that, that makes me very, very uh, concerned. Uh, but more than that, um, I'm, I'm very, uh, like, well, you know, 
pretty deeply involved in a lot of stuff in the city, but in this area in particular, I've had the 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 uh, uh, unfortunate need to swim in the Anacostia River when my sailboat capsized down by the naval uh, by the Bolden Air Force Anacostia at Bolden Air Force Base. Uh, I, I have uh, got ridden bikes and motorcycles throughout the city, which I don't do much now because uh, my balance doesn't necessarily encourage that. So I'm very, I mean, I've done these things, but the river, what I'm concerned about is I'm hearing a lot of presentations here that sound like the same arguments that were used to build highway systems mm -hmm. and freeways through our communities. You know, we got to get connectivity. We got to get through here faster. But we got to get there. I think that the the concept I, I'm I, overall I'm, I'm all in favor of this, but we've got to think about how we build a a a transportation system which have, because it's a bike doesn't make it any less of a system, and 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 spread roadways that might cut folk off from the river itself. So I think that there certainly has got to be more uh, some 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 thought if it hasn't been given already. That make sure that this 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 highway system, I mean bike system, I'm sorry, uh, doesn't cut people off from the river itself, which is the real, uh, maybe the heart of, of this of this beauty, uh, beautiful place that we have that we have, we're working with. That that is the land of our or uh, Anacostia River East and that river in particular. So I've got some real concerns. First, when a community that I believe the uh, uh, should be very much involved was seemingly cut off from the participation. That troubles me. I'm sure it wasn't intentional, but it happened. It sounds like it happened. I think there's got to be a way to mitigate that. Secondly, I do believe that we cannot think of this as just a, a great way to get bikes and, uh, and walkways through communities. I mean, that's what we said when we were building 295 and cut off Anacostia, Anacostia River East from the rest of the city uh, and other things. So we, this, this, this is a, a, a road system that has got to think about what's on each side of the road system and the river on one and the community on the other and how they need to be able to access, access the, the natural side of the river and the, and the community and not just think about a pathway through it. Uh, so I, I think there's some other issues that need to be considered. The, the cutting this off is a dead end, I think is a problem. Uh, I lived uh, about a block from the Arboretum and spent a lot of time there when I was a young person at an apartment that I lived. My first apartment was right next to the Arboretum. I spent time there. It's a great play place. But and, and also the golf course. I played that course many, many times. And the fourth hole, which is next to this this particular uh, pathway, uh, they may want to think about whether there are any stray, like me, stray golf shots that may go far right. Could be uh, need to be maybe protected if the if the, if the foliage is removed and too much. So you know I got a lot of a lot of questions. Mainly is that our participation of a community is not I can't accept that. Uh, and secondly, I think we cannot look at this as just a way to make connectivity like we did with the highway systems all through this country that tend to cut off communities of need and communities like uh, Anacostia River East communities from 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 things. Like in this case, the river and access to the river, fishing and going into the river and that type of thing. So that's where I am, Madam and Madam Chair and members of the commission. Uh, so uh, I'm out. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Commissioner Cash. Thank you very, I'm sorry, Commissioner Tix, and I know who you are. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for your, your input. We appreciate it. And we know you feel passionately about this. Uh, Commissioner Cash. Yeah, people are you mixed up with Commissioner Dixon all the time. Um, I know, uh, I know. <laughs> I just want to thank all the members of the public for coming in and sharing your views. Um, I came into to this uh, a little bit after the uh, the presentation, but still listened to to a lot of the comments. So I thank everyone on on all the sides for for a lot of the the really I think good comments that that you've put in front of us. Um, and because I missed a part of the presentation for the moment, uh, I'll leave it at, at that. But again, really thank you to everyone to, uh, for coming in, sharing your views. Thank you, Commissioner Cash. Commissioner Davis. I'm sorry, I believe Commissioner Davis has um, had to leave the meeting early. Uh, so I'm moving on to Commissioner um, Laura Hassett. Hi, I'd like to thank everyone for their presentations, but I don't have any other comments to add at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Commissioner Kozar. 
Um, I uh, really appreciate um, the dialogue we've had about this, which is a really important and exciting project and good to see how um, it's advancing goals of the Anacostia Waterfront Initiative. Um, and really, uh, and bringing access to, to areas that really need it and making connections. I really want to share appreciation to those who uh, testified today, both um, uh, in, uh, virtually and then also sent in testimony, and even more people who have been participating and helping to shape and influence this project over the past uh, six plus years, if I've got the the members write, um, uh, appreciate your passion about this. Um, I, I am compelled by the points related to kind of the connectivity on the Arboretum side and mm -hmm. the opening up uh, of gates there. And so really hope to see in the future um, uh, approaches and ideas um, uh, from, uh, from MPS about how we might do that. Um, lastly, I just want to thank the staff for uh, the excellent presentation and and reminding us uh, where the project has been and what's ahead of us now. Thank you, Commissioner Kozar. Commissioner McMahon. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I, I also want to thank the uh, the staff for a great presentation again, and on a topic which may may most of us would not have thought would be as controversial as this is today until we reflect on it some. Um, that's reflected, I think, in the, the large number of comments we've received and the speakers who's talked about both sides of the project. Um, I'm not sure yet, uh, as I listen to the other commissioners talk, how I'm going to the vote, although I'm um, concerned about two or three issues uh, as I look at it. The first is a couple reflected is, um, while it's important, I think, great that we're providing a connection across the Anacostia to um, the operatum, I think it's much more like to hear about, and, and, and I think we have a DDOT member here we talked about, maybe can also talk, uh, and Commissioner Stidham may have some comments when we get to her, about the long-term plans and what that looks like to complete, you know, looks to be a, a, you know, what can be an, a valuable and important link in a transportation network that doesn't rely on cars for Anacostia um, and coming across, because certainly, um, going, just going to two gates will be closed at seven at five o'clock every night mm -hmm. is not going to be provide a great value. I think that this this particular connection can provide. Um, secondly, looking at the at the designs and and I'm an engineer, but I look at this and I think one of the, com the commenters, the public said, "Hey, it looks like a road a road bridge that we just built." And I tend to support that. I think there come should have been a um, better thought about how we can. Um, provide a bridge that's much more uh, reflective of the area. And while maybe not a monumental bridge, certainly a bridge that looks better than what it is there today. I think maybe we focus too much on a low profile bridge coming across. I know that CFA would disagree with me and they, they might be right, but <laughs> even looking up at Bladensburg, you know, that's a good example. Um, not going to argue for you know any kind of a cable state bridge due to the foundation problems, but certainly we could probably have, have done better with that. And that would have, I think, incorporated possibly a bridge that would have allowed reduced number of, of um, pile supports for that bridge, you know, eliminating potentially even the center span uh, support and going with a three span bridge that would take care of some of the issues that were raised by our, our uh, members of the community who use the waterfront for rowing and, and those types of events, although uh, it won't solve what looks to be the key problem I heard about today, which is at the the Anacostia, like many other waterways, is silting in. And as a member of Fairfax County, I see that going on every day today for Akatink, Lake Akatink, for those who, who watch the goings on in, in my part of the DMV. Uh, lastly, I look at some of the dates of, the, of how this thing evolved. And well, you know, while we say we had great community contact and communication on this project, some of it goes back to 2017, I think. And, and while I, I think there's probably still benefit for this bridge as part of the transportation network as we continue to, to evolve what happens in Anacostia, um, perhaps it wasn't as recent as it needed to be. So um, I think the project's good. I think it's deserving at least a preliminary approval from uh, the commission, but I'm not sure it's ready for final approval. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for your comments, Commissioner McMahon. <clears throat> I appreciate that. Um, and Commissioner Stidham. I think you're still on mute, uh, Commissioner Stidham. Is that better? 
Yes, it works. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Goodman. Um, and really thank you to everyone who signed up today um, to speak and all of the folks who sent in yeah, either emails and letters, um, either in support or in opposition. This has been, um, uh, I understand that this has been a project that has been going on for a really long time. Um, as uh, I know that the Anacostia River Walk um, trail itself um, has been going on uh, for planning for a very long time. And um, like this project, I understand that it was, it's been implemented in segments um, because like all big projects, uh, the funding comes in small pieces um, and does not come where you can build and construct the entire thing at one time. Um, so and it's not surprising to me um, that there's a, a length of period between the time that the planning first begun and where we are today. Um, it's really just a matter of things. I recall that um, a portion of the trail was constructed up to Benning Bridge. And in fact, it stopped um, at under the bridge. Um, and there was a wall of vegetation. So you rode your bike and you ended up with this wall of vegetation. And that's because that's as far as that amount of money could get you. Um, and um, two or three years later, uh, that wall of vegetation was gone and the trail um, was constructed all the way up to Bladensburg. Um, so it's, it's not surprising uh, to me that uh, it's taken a while and that the, the bridge will provide a connection over to the Arboretum um, to an area, I believe, which is um, uh, a, right now a gravel driveway. So you can get around and get over to um, Bladensburg Road. Um, but I do know that there are plans and active plans in the future to um, formalize a trail that will provide greater connection. And again, that is yet another segment I believe the agencies are working on. Um, and when I say agencies, I know that uh, the district, all the district agencies and the Park Service have been working together on a variety of projects in this area. Um, I wonder, Chair, if we could bring up DDOT to uh, speak to a few um, things that came up during um, the testimony from others. I'm certainly open to that if there's no objection from the other commissioners. Hearing no objection, um, Commissioner Sidham, would you like to direct some questions or at, uh, for DDOT to respond to and who would be speaking from DDOT? Um, I believe Kyle Olson is here with us um, from DDOT. Okay, is he still on? Okay, Kyle. He is. Hi, Mr. Olson. I, I, I would like you to touch on two pieces. Um, I think one um, is uh, the public engagement um, and how um, DDOT went about um, those activities beyond uh, the, um, the public meetings that were held. What were, so basically, what were your efforts to engage the public? Was it just the, the public meeting that was held or were there other efforts to engage and get the uh, feedback from the community? Uh, thank you for that question. And thank you to the commission for uh, entertaining this project this afternoon. There were uh, a number of different touch points with the community. Um, as we mentioned, there, there was a presentation made in uh, Ward 5 and Ward 7 in 2019. And then we also did the, the routine presentation, the project presentation update in uh, this past summer. Beyond that, we have participated in a few ANC meetings. Um, some of those were actually requested by the ANC staff that we come in and present and provide some additional detail, some additional opportunity for residents to ask uh, specific questions. We have also received a number of questions through email um, following some of the presentations that we have made and we've done our best to get back to folks with some clarity uh, if they had any follow-up either question or just wanted to make a comment. There have been some quasi-public meetings and um, some of those have involved our government partners. So we have participated in those meetings. There is the Anacostia Water, uh, Watershed Community Advisory Committee. Um, I believe we have been requested to speak at that on occasion. So we have uh, been, made ourselves available to speak and provide some detail um, as requested 
So we have certainly made a, a genuine effort to engage with the community. Um, of course, the Park Service has been instrumental in that, and um, it has been a, a good partnership. Great, thank you, Miss. Go ahead. Excuse Sorry, me, Chair. Mr. Student, I just, I think I heard this in one of the uh, comments, but I just want clarification. Is there a raise grant that's been provided for this bridge construction? There is. Um, I'm sorry, I wasn't sure if that was a, a question for me or Ms. Stidham, um, but but there is. There was a, a joint uh, application that was submitted, and uh, this project is uh, receiving a portion of that of that uh, award. I I see. It. Um, well, thank you. I'm I'm just curious what the amount is and and how much of it is going to be covered. I'm just curious, and because that has a deadline. Um, for expenditure, I believe. And I just wanted to know a little more about that. But in the meantime, I'll uh, recognize Commissioner Wright. Thank you. you. I have, I have yeah. Two, yeah, I have two questions that I probably should have answered them earlier, but I mean, asked them earlier. One is, is it true that the, that the environmental assessment is, I think, one of the Speaker said it was dates from 2011. Is that true? This I is for either uh, Commissioner Stidham or Mr. Olson. Um, I could I could speak to that, which I, I know is unusual, but frankly, I'm still transitioning. This was actually my project, um, so I can't speak. The EA is from 2011, um, and we underwent, as I believe the Autumn Society mentioned, that our NEPA handbook requires us uh, to go back and reevaluate NEPA to ensure that the NEPA is not stale. Um, so we did. We went back. We evaluated both the oh, project, the okay. revised design, and we issued. We did issue a memo to file, which I would have to say, I believe, is more than administrative. Okay. Um, and to, to cover our needs and to refresh it. And we're in, of course, um, uh, Section 106 continued along. In Section 7, we continue as we continue um, work on the bridge. Okay. I, I, I didn't think that could have been the whole picture. And then my second question is, I mean, I don't want a long engineering explanation. Can I just hear the primary reason why a clear span was um, option was eliminated? I think I know, but I'm just testing, testing. <laughs> um, is who who is who's that question directed to? Um, Either one. I, I'm I'm assuming okay. that Mr. Olson can can answer that, but I might be wrong. I think yeah, he I, might be. On, oh, there he is. Okay. Yes. Yep. I'm here. I so I can I can start, and then if you want some additional detail, we do have Mr. Joe Spadea with us from our design uh, design firm. There are a number of factors at play here. And if we consider the navigation channel, the desire to minimize disturbance to Kenilworth Park because of the potentially sensitive soil from the, the former landfill site, the limited space on the west bank of the Arbor, or excuse me, on the west bank of the Anacostia, there's that narrow park service strip between the riverbank and the Arboretum. And we did not want to encroach upon the Arboretum yeah. property. It's never been the in intention. Okay. Uh, we consider ADA accessibility. We consider the river users. There are flood elevations. The, the seawall on both sides of the river is historic. There was the guidance in the EA that this type of a, a larger type of structure uh, should be avoided. Right. In so, the so, so sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I know everybody's going to have a really long day. So the bottom line is that is that the larger support structure on the banks of the of, on either side precluded, and it probably was more expensive. Is, and that's a fair reason. Was it? Is that also true? It, it would likely be more expensive, but aside from that, striking the balance with all of these factors is yeah. important. And so when we consider all of those other factors, even before looking at cost, we consider all of those other factors, um, this is the resulting structure. Okay. I, I, I'm not, I don't mean to be rude, no, um, but okay. that, that suffices as that's, that's a, that's a perfectly good reason. Thank you. And Mr. Spadea, I think you have your hand up um, or you did. Yes. Thank you, commissioner Goodman. Thank you uh, for the, 
for the time here and the opportunity to speak. I did want to just address and add to that. Um, during our geotechnical exploration, uh, we did encounter a aquifer beneath the Anacostia River in this region. Um, deep foundations would definitely uh, impact that aquifer. The bridge, as we currently have it designed, uses shallower foundations, which will not impact the aquifer. Okay. So that's that's also something that um, you know is part of our design uh, criteria. That's another good reason. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. And I, Thank you. And I did want to add, um, in addition to the public meetings that we had, um, contrary to the discussion and the testimonial, we did have, we did, um, myself, National Park Service, Kyle, and members of DDOT, we actually uh, rode and traced boat um, on August 26, 2019, to view the river. Prior to that, before uh, the design team was even awarded this project, we were out there in 2016, walking up and down the banks of the river. We were back out there again once we were awarded the project. Uh, we call it a preliminary uh, trail walk where the consultants get together with NPS and DDOT and we walk the trail to understand the site. So we did visit it. We are well, well aware of the nature um, of the setting. Um, yeah, that's what I, I, can, I have other things I can add, but I'll let other folks talk. That's right. and, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there Chair additional Goodman, that, yes. that was it for me. Okay. Um, if there are no further questions for uh, DDOT or um, these uh, experts on, on online, then we're going to move along. And we move to Commissioner Argo at this time. I think you I, there you are. Oh, unmuted. Um, I had... Uh, I think the couple of questions I had um, have already been covered by the dialogue that we just had, which was very helpful. Appreciate that. I pre always appreciate um, Commissioner um, Commissioner Wright's uh, comments and questions as well. Um, I had one other. Um, oh. If there was any more um, information, and, and we really don't have to get it now, but uh, I was concerned about the comment that the terminus, terminus is, is, is at locked gates and the concerns that the public had about that. But it's, it's something that we can, you know, we can, I would ask the staff to to essentially look at that and what kind of potential impact that would have. And I, I really, um, I'll align myself also with um, some of the other comments that have been made. I don't have any other at this point. Uh, okay. Such an interesting, such an interesting project. And also I wanted to say, I appreciate so much the, um, the work of the river keepers. And uh, I just wanted to, to say that. Thank you very much, Commissioner Argo. Commissioner Hugh, Hewlett, I'm sorry, Vice Chair Hewlett. No worries. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Will for his um, presentation today. It was very mm -hmm. thoughtful and very thorough. Um, and Agreed. I'd like to thank everyone who um, submitted comments in writing and or who participated today uh, virtually or both. And some did in fact do both. Um, you know, I think uh, Mr. Olson said, you know, you're striking a balance here because there are um, consequences either way, whether you, uh, whether you have the clear span bridge or not. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, Commissioner Stedham, too, um, for her questions, her thoughtful questions to um, DDOT and for her earlier participation. So what I hear now are that opponents say that the... Um, current bridge design will have um, a negative environmental impact and it's not safe for boaters and rowers. But yet I, we've heard the reasons that have been specified about the clear span bridge would require larger excavation, deeper foundations, which could disturb the aquifer, greater visual impact, and would be more extensive and expensive inspections and maintenance. Um, and that there's a narrow space and didn't want to encroach on the historic seawall. 
So there's a, that balance right there. And the um, bridge opponents also uh, cite safety issues. I think I heard people say it was too shallow for these piers to go in the ground. Yet I heard that um, that the um, Clearspan Bridge would require deeper um, foundations and larger excavations. So, so you know, you're balancing that as well. Um, and then we're talking about the space, um, the 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 123 foot space between those two piers, um, and yet the Benning Road Bridge has a clearance of 110 feet, and the New York Avenue has a clearance of 114 feet. Um, but that doesn't necessarily make this right. But uh, I was curious to see if anyone had a comment, um, Mr. Olson, or someone had a comment on that clearance. Um, and and it and is in fact the sh the soil too shallow, um, and then the other thing I heard was the uh, you know that there hasn't been enough community impact. I heard someone say three months is not, and I read we read all of these things that have been submitted. Believe me, I've got documents here, left and right. Am I frozen? Looks like I'm frozen. Yeah, but we can hear you. Okay. Vice okay. So okay. So. Um, so someone said that three months was not enough time. And then another person said that one long summer meeting was not enough. And yet I'm reviewing all this, the staff presentations. And I were told that there were, um, yes, some of these meetings date back to at least 2017 or 2018. And there were at least eight smaller stakeholder meetings um, with the ANC from um, 7th Ward 7 and Ward 5 from the Anacostia Watershed Citizens Advisory Committee not just in, in 2018, but in 2020 and 2021, and then the ANCs in 2023. And then there was the July 23, a uh, huge meeting with 109 community members representing all sorts of entities. Um, so that sounds like community input to me. And that was in July, that la last one was in July of 2023, which is far more than three months ago. So there is community participation. What does concern me is that someone said that they weren't able to get in. Um, it's probably good that you can't see me because I just gesticulate a lot. My hands are just a moving and a moving. Um, so anyway, uh, that they've said that they could not get into the meeting and and they, uh, I, I guess I'm paraphrasing, but felt like they were uh, couldn't get any questions answered. And, and although that question was asked, I did not hear a response to that specific um, concern. But, uh, but, but for that, that's the thing that does bother me if, if in fact that's accurate. But the rest of it, I think we're, I think they're making a really, I think the staff recommendation is a good recommendation given all these factors that we've heard today. And it is balancing competing interests and it is, you know, it's striking that balance as Mr. Olson said. Um, but I don't like it if, if people were precluded from participating, that's different, um, that that does bother me. Um, so I would like someone to respond to that specific allegation. And um, I think that was it for now. Thank you, Commissioner Hewlett. Does anyone have a response to this uh, community engagement question? Yes, um, Mr. Spadia. Yes, hi. Um, we are a community or, um, outreach uh, individual that ran that. Working with them uh, indicated, I guess the person initially could not access, but later in the q and I believe they were able to join and access it. Um, but it wasn't, you know, I don't believe it was any intentional. I think we had something like a hundred or so folks okay. um, that accessed that call. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. And I also, and I have to um, extend my deepest appreciation and respect um, to Commissioner Dixon, because I know that he's been um, concerned about Anacostia and the river for decades, and as have some of us from, at least for me, from my Prince George's County standpoint as well, the river knows no geographic boundaries. So that's all I had to comment on. Thank you very much, Commissioner Hewlett. Um, Commissioner Green. Thank you very much. Um, 
you know, I'm supportive of the overall project, in particular the way it advances the, the long-term goals of the Anacostia Waterfront Initiative. I do have a couple questions. Um, I mean, for me, the overall question, which I think we'll take into our discussion, is, you know, how does the system support both natural and community interests? I think that's what we've been hearing. Um, as many fellow commissioners have, have um, raised, I, I am concerned about the connectivity issue. Um, I, having those gates open only from eight to five is, I mean, there, there, there has to be a solution to this. And it has to be a solution that comes sooner rather than later and doesn't await a future phase, which may or may not occur. Um, did have a couple sort of technical questions on the bridge solution. Um, I, um, it would have been interesting to have seen um, more development of the bridge options instead of the sort of the diagrammatic responses that had almost you know great vertical exaggeration in the the support systems. I understand the the issues, and I understand balancing that with keeping the profile low. But I wonder if there weren't options besides flat, you know, that were discussed with with other stakeholders. Um, um, it, it seems like the the solutions we were shown we were shown a design option and diagrammatic um, dismissals of other solutions. Um, it, it, maybe it's not technically possible, but it would have been interesting to see a little more development of that. And my last two questions were already addressed just a moment ago about um, community engagement, which was just addressed. And um, uh, and the question about the environmental assessment was, was also addressed. So those, those are my questions, thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Green. Um, and finally, Commissioner Wright has the last word almost today. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's never good. Um, um, I, I, I kind of I, the gate issue doesn't bother me. It's an operational one. Um, it's not a designer planning one, so I think they can figure that out. Um, this will not be the first time today that I disagree with CFA. Um, I think the design could have been a little better, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna die on that hill because I think I am. I am unpersuaded, with all due respect to Commissioner Dixon, I am I am unpersuaded that this is tantamount to a highway, um, and I well understand the 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 many times in urban history that we have been sold a bill of goods in the name of transportation and connectivity that has done the exact opposite and cut off whole neighborhoods. I'm from Baltimore. I know a lot about this. Um, I, I I actually think the opposite. I think I'm persuaded by the testimony that this will bring great connectivity and access to a community that we all probably do agree has been somewhat <coughs> neglected. Um, moreover, I am unpersuaded by the rowers with all due respect. Um, for me, it really becomes an issue of the greater good. And while I understand the, and and I, I think the rowers are wonderful. It's a great sport. Access to the water is um, important for everyone, though. Um, and 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 this to me, um, the 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 benefits to the community far out outweigh um, what the the objections of the rowers. I I I. I it, it, it really does come down to critical mass for me. So um, I support this project and I think it's high time to get on with it. Thank you, Commissioner Wright. So <clears throat> I'm going to weigh in here now. Um, I really do appreciate the staff presentation. Uh, Mr. Weil, thank you very much. And also um, all the comments from those who feel so deeply about this, this project. And I too am going to um, apologize in advance to Commissioner uh, Dixon because I, I value his experience and his insights and his passion about his neighborhood and his um, concern for public engagement around these important transportation projects. I do want to say that it somehow that there's the fact that we had so many testifying today makes me think that we may have been able to 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 have done a little better job of reaching out in the community engagement piece only because I practice this too daily in my in my work 
in a community. The equity issue rises to the top for me, just as Commissioner Wright cited. Um, this, this, to me, looks like a connector, not a segregating uh, transportation infrastructure project. I think that um, having read the, all the documents that we've received and heard the hearing the testimony, I think that um, this project is important and it's important now. And I'm not worried about the gates either or the fences over at the Arboretum. There are alternative paths through that space, as we know, to connect to uh, the other side that, that are going to be safe and frankly could um, in, in a good way, spur more rapid development of trails on the other side. Because again, living in a community, when you when we have trails in communities, you don't get hundreds of millions of dollars at one time to build an entire trail system. You build it in phases as you're able to afford it. And that's why I asked about the raise grant. I wondered if, because you were successful in getting the raise grant, if that maybe had um, in some way impeded the full community engagement around this. Um, I, too, the, the other part of my life is passion for rivers and Mississippi River and tributaries in 31 states and two provinces of Canada. I hear the river keeper. I understand their concerns. Again, I think this can be a not either or. It could be both and. And I think to maintain that community engagement around this project going forward, there could be other solutions that both the neighborhood and the um, the ward and the and the river users, the rowers working together, there can be solutions. And you don't want to mess up an aquifer. That would not be a solution or a desirable impact for this project in any way. When we speak to the um, the clear span concept. So I just want to say, to me, the greater good rises to the top. Um, the concern for the river remains. I, I think it is a wild little river in an urban space that's been abused. And I hope that there are positive outcomes, again, with the community working together, especially um, Commissioner uh, Dixon's community of R. Um, I I hope that there can be ways to work through this, but I do think the connectivity uh, addresses uh, a long, long, la long term segregation of this neighborhood. And I think that we need to address that first. So that's my, my feeling. Uh, the one thing Ms., uh, Commissioner McMahon cited uh, was the, um, the possibility of a preliminary, uh, but not final approval. But I, I leave that to staff if, if we need to move forward with um, the motion as uh, was was uh, made. I think that that's fine if we need to vote on that. And um, uh, that's that's my feeling on this is the equity comes first. Madam Chair. There, yes, sir, Commissioner Dixon. First of all, I appreciate the few, uh, some of the commissioners who found empathy for my position. Uh, I want to be clear about one thing, though. I, I didn't suggest that the system, the 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 bike, the path uh, would would cut off, was not connecting areas. I think that's great. But my concern is that, as the uh, uh, was mentioned, that it doesn't cut access off to the river to actually be able to cross it and go in and use the river uh, in some kind of way that makes sense. The natural spaces on either side of this. Uh, so it doesn't because the 295, I was there when it was built and it did cut us off from getting to the Anacostia River, though it did mm -hmm. create a great highway from from uh, one from Baltimore from D.C. right through our community. And we couldn't get past it because we couldn't I couldn't walk across it. I did before to go to the playground and front fair lawn and play basketball. I had to go a very different path to get to it. So that's like that was my concern. And uh, it, whether or not the participation was enough or not. From the community, uh, it, there's never enough of it. It's always you always want more. I, I've been in this, around this enough to know that. But it does sound like there was an instance here where there was a, a, a lack of, of the kind of participation we would all want, and I don't feel good about that. And I want to make it clear, and we'll vote accordingly. Uh, believe me, of all those on the commission, I certainly don't want to see this delay because I like to walk the path myself or ride it on a bike, maybe even. So I don't want to slow this down. <laughs> But uh, anyhow, thank you very much for my that thank, extra words. Thank, thank you, Commissioner Dixon, always. Um, does anyone else have any anything to contribute before we vote? Any further comment? 
Any question? Yes, Commissioner Stidham. Um, I would I would just like to add um, to um, Arrington's, uh, uh, Commissioner Dixon's very um, passionate interest of not just uh, having a connection across the river, the river, but having a connection to the river. And, and, sh um, and from my understanding of the project, um, it's, it's a connection to and through, um, not impeding either. Um, so um, really, it's a very well, it's a well thought out project that really is connecting a community that has not been connected for a very long time. Thank you for that, Commissioner Stidham. And also, we know that the most important thing that um, um, we can do in terms of river and conservation of rivers is to allow people to experience the river. So you, I agree with you that Commissioner Dixon's comments are, are correct. And I, but I see that that possibility is there with this with this project. That in fact, it does allow people to get down closer to the river to fish on both sides to to have access. I guess I'm just intuiting that, but I could be wrong. But I do I do agree with you that um, you know the way we make river keepers and river advocates is by exposing people to rivers. And I see this project is doing that. That's just my opinion. I could be dead wrong, but just wanted to say that. Yes, Joseph Padilla, you have a comment. Yes, I just wanted to add, um, having, um, I don't think my video is on, but having been a part of this project since 2017, um, a couple things to note. One, uh, presently the river, as you heard, is very shallow. Um, with or without the bridge, the same, same challenge exists. Uh, the, pur the purpose of this project is not to deal with the dredging of the river. Um, however, we did have two separate meetings with the rowing community, with National Parks and DDOT. We did hear about rowing lanes, the desire to have four rowing lanes, two in each direction, and one buffer in the middle. Um, and our, our current span arrangement provides that. Um, in fact, the, the span width of 123 feet, again, just for clarity and scale, is the length of an A380 Airbus plane. So. These are very wide openings, and the piers are only approximately three feet wide. And that represents, you know, between the seawalls is approximately 292 feet at the bridge location. So three piers at three feet is nine feet. It's approximately 3% of the river crossing in this area. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Spadia. Okay. Is there any further comment by the commissioner? The commissioners or questions? Hearing, hearing none, then we will move to the vote. And uh, Ms. Coster, could you please read the motion? Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a motion to approve the preliminary and final site development plans for the Anacostia Riverwalk Trail Extension and National Arboretum Access Bridge. Uh, Commissioner Stidham made the motion and Commissioner Wright seconded. So with that, Commissioner Cozart? Yes. Uh, Commissioner McMahon? Yes. Commissioner Stidham? Yes. yes. Commissioner Argo? Yes. Commissioner Hewlett? Yes. Chair Goodman? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Wright? Yes. Commissioner Dixon? Abstain. Commissioner Cash? Yes. Uh, and Commissioner Hassett? I abstain. Okay, um, thank you very much. That motion has carried and um, we will now move on. Okay, um, to the next agenda item. That was a marathon. Okay, um, our <laughs> last, oh, I better get myself re <laughs> reconnoitered here. Uh, okay, okay. We, we are now um, going to move to um, uh, the next item on the agenda. Uh, 
And that is, I'm going to look at this. The, we're going to begin to uh, cover the, fi the final site and development plans for the Anacostia River Walk. Um, I, I apologize. Yeah, I Hang on. I'm, I'm moving on here. My, I'm, okay. Now we are moving on to agenda item 6B. Sorry. I did know it wasn't the Anacostia River Walk. But um, we were going to approve preliminary building plans for the William Howard Taft Bridge Pedestrian Railing Improvements. And Mr. Webb is going to be giving the presentation today. Mr. Webb, my apologies. Yes, thank you. Are you all able to hear me and see my presentation? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon, Chair Goodman and members of the commission. The District Department of Transportation is seeking the approval of preliminary building plans to alter the railings at the William Howard Taft Bridge along Connecticut Avenue as it crosses Rock Creek Parkway in Northwest Washington, DC. The purpose of the project is to develop a suicide deterrent barrier system that reduces the potential of suicide attempts, minimizes the impacts to the existing historic bridge fabric and surrounding view sheds, and provides a deterrent barrier or replacement design that is compatible with the bridge aesthetics. Here is a map that shows the bridge's location in Northwest Washington, connecting the Colorama neighborhood to Woodley Park neighborhood. The commission provided comments on the applicant's concepts for three design approaches back on November 2nd, 2023. The commission recommended the applicant continue to develop two approaches Option two, which was the addition of a wire mesh fencing, and option three, which was the removal and replacement of the existing concrete pedestals, piers, and metal railings with new higher railings. The commission also suggested additional design refinements to minimize the visual and physical impacts to the bridge while meeting the project goals. The applicant will return to the commission for a final review in upcoming months. At preliminary review, the Commission evaluates the applicant's approach to the proposed building plans, any impacts to key views, and how the project has responded to previous Commission comments. In this case, the applicant has provided additional information as requested on the two options recommended to be carried forward at the concept review. And again, they were the option two, the addition of a metal wire mesh, to the bridge and option three, which would be the removal and replacement of the existing concrete elements and the metal railing to be raised to the meet the eight feet height requirement. As a reminder, the applicant shared at the concept review in order to meet the project goals, the design criteria for any options would need to include that it has to be eight feet in height above any foothold, Maximize finger clearance to prevent handholds by reducing projections to less than one inch. Minimize horizontal element projections that could be used for footholds. And if you went with that approach for new additions, the material should consider metal packet, uh, metal picket fencing or a metal mesh. As part of the current submission, the applicant provided additional information as requested. Overall, staff finds that the applicant has been responsive to the Commission's request for this information. Based on the materials provided and staff's further evaluation of both options, which I will discuss in today's presentation, staff concurs with option three, which is the removal and replacement of the existing concrete pedestals and piers. Option three includes several design variations that deal with the profile and proportion of the top of the concrete pedestals. Option 3A of the four options for removal matches the existing proportion and hierarchy of elements that exist today. As a result of alterations to the bridge in the 1990s, the concrete and metal railing components were replaced with new in-kind materials to replicate the historic design of the pedestals, piers, and railing. As such, it is important to point out that the existing fabric is not historic. In reviewing the original three concept options, we noted that this option, option three, does not use new materials or a design vocabulary that is different from the existing bridge. 
This reconstruction approach avoids the insertion of new discordant architectural components. The railing and pedestals would be replaced with new taller railings that would achieve the project's eight foot tall height. The existing lamp post would be raised to accommodate the increased height. This approach relies on the material and design approach of the historic bridge. As I mentioned, the applicant has provided four options, A through D, for the removal and replacement of the existing elements, which are distinguished by the height relationship between the lamppost pedestals and the adjacent piers. As shown here, you'll note that they are all very similar to each other with only minor differences in the relative heights of the components. Option 3A recreates the existing configuration of pedestals, piers, and railings in the same materials and design character, but increased to the necessary height to achieve the intended public health and safety objectives. This option exactly retains the relationship between these elements. The other options provide some variations that are different from the existing proportions. As such, Staff recommends that the Commission find that option 3A recreates the existing configuration of pedestals, piers, and railings at an incre increased height, maintains the original design character and existing hierarchy between the lamppost pedestals and adjacent piers, and is visually compatible with the rest of the bridge. Since the concept review, the applicant has also studied different approaches to the dimensions of the new metal railings should they be replaced, including both the top rail and the pickets, to see if the increased height would require altering their size. Currently, the metal railings are typically 17 feet, 17 feet between concrete pedestals, with each picket 1 and 1 8 inch square, and picket spacing at 4 inches on center, and a gap between pickets at approximately 2.4 inches. With the increase in height under the preferred option, 3A, the pickets would be one and three eight inch square and a picket spacing at five and a half inch on center. And the gap between the pickets would be at three and a half inches. After looking at different dimensions for the top rail, the applicant's preferred approach is to retain the existing top rail dimensions at six inches wide and four inches tall. Staff supports advancing option 3A to final review. Staff suggests that the Commission recommend that the applicant continue to refine option 3A prior to submitting for final review with a focus on minimizing the size and diameter of the top railing, maximizing picket spacing, and providing appropriate fence transitions at the ends of the bridge where the railings meet the Perry Lions. Now let's look at the other design option that had been carried forward from the concept review. The Commission previously recommended advancing option two, which is the addition of wire mesh metal fencing on the inside of the existing concrete pedestals and metal railings for further development and requested the applicant provide additional information on such consideration as the design standard and deterrence needed, the size, number, and type of stanchions needed, color options, and any measure that may help make the mesh less visibly obtrusive. The new metal mesh fencing would have a height of eight feet with stanchions located every eight feet, six inches. The applicant has provided additional information on the wire mesh with welded wire mesh consisting of a galvanized carbon steel plate barb size one millimeter or two millimeters with an outer coating. It is known to be extremely difficult to cut and difficult to climb. The density and strength of the mesh is confirmed to be the minimum necessary to meet the project's goals. The density prevents hand or footholds and climbing. The strength is required for structural integrity and to prevent cutting. As such, the overall density or transparency of the mesh cannot be further reduced. The applicant has explored whether a black or a green color options for the mesh. Here is a rendering showing the green, uh, which will try to match the existing coloring of the metal railing. Both color options have similar visual impacts. In reviewing the additional information provided in this submission, 
Staff recommends the Commission finds that option two, while providing the required safety goals, introduces a new and discordant architectural component that is industrial in character, lacks a sense of permanence, and is inconsistent with the, the existing bridge aesthetic. Further, staff visited a local bridge with a mesh fencing system and found it is clearly perceived as an addition and not well integrated into the bridge design. Overall, the wire mesh, me, uh, excuse me, the wire metal mesh material does not contribute to an inviting or comfortable pedestrian experience. Therefore, staff suggests the commission recommends that option two, the wire mesh fencing, be dismissed from further consideration. To conclude, staff recognizes the applicant's need to alter the Taft Bridge's pedestrian railings in order to deter suicide attempts. Staff also appreciates the applicant recognizes the historic nature of the bridge and the need to consider design solutions that minimize impacts to the historic character and important view sheds. Staff recommends that the Commission approve the preliminary building plans for the William Howard Taft Bridge pedestrian railing improvements as provided in option 3A, which includes removing and replacing the existing concrete pedestals and metal railings with new, taller railings and pedestals that meet the project's safety requirements. This concludes my presentation. I have incorporated all the recommendations, so I will not repeat them. Um, again, I would like to now introduce Mr. Matthew Marcoux, who's with the District's Department of Transportation, who would like to provide some remarks to the Commission. Also, representatives from the project design team and subject experts are also here to assist in answering any questions the Commission may have. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Webb. And Mr. Marcoux, did you have some comments? I did, very brief. Um, thank you very much. We appreciate the uh, National Capital Planning Commission's continued interest and support of this vital behavioral health initiative that has a transportation nexus. Um, it's clear from the prior discussion that the National Capital Planning Commission takes um, the input and the guidance that they receive from others, uh, particularly affected people of the community, into account as they make uh, a very reasoned uh, decisions. Um, and so we appreciate the opportunity to um, present back before you with the updates that we've made based on the prior comments that we've received from the National Capital Planning Commission. And I will note that I hope all the commissioners will agree with the CFA today and help us continue to move this one forward. I know that Commissioner Hewlett, I think you had made the comment about perhaps uh, not agreeing with CFA today, but hopefully in this case you will. Oh, you're on mute. I don't think that was me before. Oh, I apologize. Okay. I thought that was. But I do also want to note for Commissioner Dixon. But you're right on part two. <laughs> um, I do want to note also for Commissioner Dixon that a, 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 while he did not, uh, while he abstained from the vote, a phrase for the trail might rather, rather than the, I agree with him, it's not the Washington River, it's the Anacostia. Let's call it the Anacostia River Trail or ART. Thank Very you. cool. We appreciate your comments, Mr. Marcoux. Thank you. And again, thank you, Mr. Webb, for the presentation. So um, before we go thank on, you very much. are there any questions uh, for um, uh, staff or Mr. Marcoux? Any questions from the commissioners? Hearing none, we'll move on then, and I would entertain a motion to approve preliminary building plans for the William Howard Taft Bridge pedestrian railing improvements. Madam so Chair, I move approval for option 3A. Seconded. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Ms. Coster, um, uh, we are going to move into discussion here, so everyone has their cameras on, and I'll start with the round robin deliberations, and I'm going to begin with Commissioner Cash. Hey, thanks so much. Um, so I'll, I'm not going to rehash from the last time we saw this. I'm still disappointed that we didn't consider possibly netting. Um, but I do think out of the remaining options that that the option identified in 3A is is one of the, the better ones out there. It gives me flashbacks to the White House fence and when we got to, to mess with that. 
Um, <laughs> but I guess the comment I do want to make is, and I'm glad that Mr. Marcoux is here. There's been a lot of projects lately that this commission has approved that look really great and the thing gets built and it's either been value engineered down or it looks just completely different from what this commission saw and maybe even recommended enthusiastically. So um, I think that this 3A is the way to go. It sounds like it'll come back to us one more time with, I hope that option two to never be seen again. Um, <laughs> I really hope that even if there are funding considerations that we look at, at the budget and making sure this can happen because I, I fear that we might fall back to the option two just because of budgetary constraints and all of that. So if we're gonna do this, I really hope that we do it right and, and do it with 3A make it look good, make it a, a quality piece of engineering and don't cut any corners so that we end up with something that isn't the what the, the commission and CFA and others have, have weighed in on. So um, uh, thanks for the additional work and I look forward to this coming back to us for final approval because as has been stated, this is an important public health um, project that, that needs to get done. Um, thank you, Commissioner. And to your point, um, this has very pointed and um, substantial interest across the executive and they are being kept updated. In fact, oh. I will really be emailing uh, the um, city administrator later today to let them know what I hope will be good news that this has been approved and can continue moving forward. We are already identifying the budgetary costs so we can include that in FY24 capital reprogramming if necessary and certainly in our FY25 capital um, budget uh, formulation. So long story short, Commissioner Cash, rest assured that will, what you've experienced with prior circumstances will not happen here. And I want to note one particular reason why Dr. Bebat from the Department of Behavioral Health is on the call. And as he has noted repeatedly, and as the research has shown, you cannot um, reduce, you cannot change, you cannot alter how you do this because any opening is one opening too many. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Marcoux, and thank you, Commissioner Cash, and now Commissioner Hassett. Are you still with us? Commissioner Hassett? Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll move on to Commissioner Cozart. Perhaps just if you could ask if Commissioner Warren is here. I don't know if he is. Oh, is Commissioner Warren joined us from uh, Congressman? Comer's office. No? All right. We must have lost that commissioner. Uh, commissioner Kozar. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks to the staff for their presentation. Uh, I don't have any comments. Okay. Uh, commissioner McMahon. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, and uh, again, also thanks to the staff for putting the presentation together. Thanks to Mr. Marco for participating. In a conversation on this important project. I will echo uh, Commissioner Cash's comments, both regarding the netting. I understand that we're not going there, but that would have been, a, I think, a, also a viable solution that would have solved a lot of the architectural issues. More critically, I associate myself with Commissioner Cash and comments about let's make sure this is done right the way it's been presented to us today. We'll take a look at a final and then uh, get on and get this thing done. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McMahon. Commissioner Stidham. Thank you. Thank you for the presenters. This is a very important project and hopefully um, when implemented will serve uh, to provide a lot of safety um, and security and um, we stop seeing what is happening from that bridge. So thank you so much for um, your work on the bridge. Um, I think it's very important and greatly appreciate the thoughtfulness, not just for the safety and the security of the people, but also for uh, the historic design of the bridge and the views to and from the historic districts around. So thank you for your, your work on this project. Thank you, Commissioner Stidham. Commissioner Argo. I am um, happy to uh, support this. I'm also happy to see um, Mr. Marcoux, who I worked with um, some time ago when I worked for the city and uh, appreciate uh, the work that he's representing here um, from from DDOT to get this done. Thank I'm you, fully Commissioner supportive. Argo. Thank you, Commissioner Argo. It's <laughs> great to see you too. Thank you, Commissioner Argo. Commissioner Hewlett, Vice Chair Hewlett. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Webb and Mr. Marco. Um, this was much needed and it's much better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Green. Thank you, Vice Chair Hewlett. Commissioner Green. Thank you very much. I mean, this is important and I'm, you know, I'm happy something is moving forward. As we discussed at the last meeting, you know, I, I would have approved, would have, would have, would have uh, preferred the netting, you know, certainly as we've seen it, as sat, it, it was just put on the Golden Gate Bridge at the end of last year. It's been successful aesthetically and functionally, but that's not on the table. So given the alternatives, um, I'll, I, I will support 3A. Thank you. And Commissioner Wright. Thank you, Commissioner Green. Commissioner Wright. Well, I could not disagree more. Um, I think this is practically malpractice. Um, it's a historic bridge. We're completely changing the character of the bridge because we're confusing the what of it with the how of it. And it is setting a precedent that w is regrettable, changes the character of the entire structure, and is not reversible. And I, I, I cannot support it. I would go on, but it's been a long day already. And I, I, I know when I'm beat, but I, I, I completely disagree with the entire approach and, and would um, urge that people rethink it from, from the very beginning. It's just not the right way to, to achieve the goal. Thank you, Commissioner Wright and Commissioner Dixon. I just hope that people will get a chance to rethink before they think of doing something, even make us have to do this. So I I'm support the proposal. I guess make sure we get some help to folks who don't even have to consider you being, being protected from this kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Dixon. And I too just want to uh, you know highlight the fact that this is a difficult issue because um, public health and safety is is critical, and at the same time, these uh, these beautiful pieces of infrastructure uh, need to um, be adapted. So I appreciate the applicants' responses to our questions and uh, our took into consideration our feedback, and um, and hopefully this will move forward as designed. And hearing no further comments or questions, uh, Ms. Coster, can you please call the roll? Uh, yes, the uh, motion was made by Vice Chair Hewlett. Commissioner Dixon seconded it. And is that uh, Commissioner Kozar? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Magna? Yes. Commissioner Stidham? Yes. Commissioner Argo? Yes. Vice Chair Hewlett? Yes. Chair Goodman? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Wright? No. Commissioner Dixon? Yes. yes. Commissioner Pat? Yes. And I think Commissioners Davis and Warren are not in the meeting. Okay. okay. Motion has clearly passed and so are carried. And so we're moving on to our last agenda item, number 6C, and that is to approve comments on the concept plans for the St. Elizabeth's West Campus Gate number one garage and site development. And today, Ms. Shipman is going to be making the presentation. Ms. Shipman. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Goodman and Commissioners. The General Services Administration has submitted concept plans for the Gate 1 parking garage at the St. Elizabeth's West Campus Department of Homeland Security Headquarters. As a reminder, the St. Elizabeth's West Campus is a 176-acre site located in Southeast, Wa Southeast Washington, D.C. The entire St. Elizabeth's Hospital Campus is listed as a National Historic Landmark. This is an aerial view of the West Campus. North is to the left, and the project site is at the northeast corner within the secure perimeter near Gate 1 off of Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue. 
The Commission approved the 2008 Master Plan for the Consolidated Headquarters of DHS and the second Master Plan Amendment in 2020, with a parking ratio of 1 to 4 for standard shift employees at build-out. The proposed Gate 1 garage was included in the Master Plan Program to accommodate additional employees anticipated on site with future development including a proposed U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement building that is planned to come to the Commission for review in March. The proposed underground garage is outlined in this site plan with the dashed black line, and the proposed above-ground screening building and garage entry are shown to the east. To minimize the visual impact of the proposed garage, a meadow is planted on the roof with a restored woodland edge consistent with the site context and historic setting. The new development is also set back from two nearby historic structures, the gatehouse and, and Burroughs Cottage. The master plan located parking within the security fence at the edge of the campus to preserve a, a pedestrian oriented site. This gate entrance is primarily for employees. Visitors will enter through other designated gates. Employees walking onto the campus will enter through the perimeter gate and go directly through the screening building. Or if driving, will park in the garage, come up the elevator and through the screening building. They will then move out into the campus by foot or shuttle. VIP vehicles will also go through the screening building and then enter the campus. The photo above shows the existing conditions and historic gatehouse, and the image below shows the proposed new entry. In order to provide vehicular access to the garage, a portion of the north side of the Gate 1 masonry wall will be removed and replaced with an operable gate. The proposed garage is four floors subgrade and includes 1,500 parking spaces with elevators leading to the screening building above. The proposed meadow on the garage roof is shown in the section at the top of the slide, as well as proposed light wells, which are circled and highlighted in blue. These planted, and terraced light, these planted and terraced light wells are intended to bring in light and air and assist with wayfinding. The massing and materiality of the proposed screening is, the massing and materiality of the proposed screening building is, des, is designed to complement the historic campus and respond to the scale of the nearby historic gatehouse. The approximately 8,000 square foot building has been broken down into three pavilions at varied heights from 14 to 17 feet, based on overhead clearance needs for vehicles and elevator overruns. The proposed materials include stone, metal, and glass. An additional proposed cor corner structure at the campus entry uses the same architectural language as the screening building. Many of the design details, including the exact screening and corner building materials, are still under development and discussion. This is a view looking west towards Burroughs Cottage of the meadow roof of the garage. The meadow is intended to be multifunctional by managing stormwater, creating habitat, and reducing maintenance. The proposed conceptual plant palette includes native trees, shrubs, ground cover, and meadow species, with many that are beneficial to pollinators, including a diversity of milkweeds to encourage health of monarch butterflies. The proposed project will require the removal of 20 trees. The NCPC tree replacement policy requires 43 trees to be replaced based on the species, size, and condition of the trees to be removed. 127 trees are proposed to be replaced in the concept plans, exceeding the NCPC requirements. Finally, this is another view of the screening building from the campus entry side. It is important to note that the project team is continuing the community outreach and engagement efforts begun with previous campus master plans to address any questions and concerns. Engagement for the Gate 1 Garage project is managed through the St. Elizabeth's West Campus Opportunity Center, GSA's outreach and engagement arm, and includes regularly scheduled meetings and activities, representation at local community meetings, and information about employment and business opportunities.
GSA also reconvened federal agencies and consulting parties for Section 106 consultation in October 2023 to discuss the proposed parking garage design development and recommendations to minimize impacts to the historic campus. The consultation process is ongoing, but thus far the parties have been generally supportive of the design approach. With that, Staff recommends the Commission approve the following comments on the concept plans for the St. Elizabeth West Campus, Gate 1 Garage, and, and Site Development. Staff recommends the Commission commend design sensitivity to the historic campus and efforts to minimize the visual impacts of the proposed garage through undergrounding and integration into the landscape. In addition, Staff recommends the Commission request the applicant provide further information with the next submission related to the status of applicable historic preservation avoidance, minimization, and mitigation measures outlined in the 2008 Programmatic Agreement and 2020 Memorandum of Agreement, as well as environmental impact statement mitigation measures outlined in the 2020 Record of Decision. That concludes my presentation. Members of the applicant team from the General Services Administration, ZGF, and Olin are also available to answer any questions from the Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shipman. And are there any questions from the Commission for Ms. Shipman or her team? Any questions? Yeah, I have one, Madam Chair. Yes, sir, Commissioner Dixon. I just wondered whether the, what the trade off on the roof covering as opposed to solar. I'm not a one trick pony, but I always have to ask whether there might be a, what the option was here. I'll refer that question to the GSA representative, uh, Ms. Tunstall Williams, if you would be able to answer if you've looked at those two options. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, some reason my, my video is not going on. Um, the, there you are. The, <laughs> the campus is, uh, the landscape is part of the National Historic Landmark significance. And one of the big um, sort of, uh, I'm sorry, it's been a long day. <laughs> I apologize. One of the, the big um, components of it is, is a lawn and, and um, a wide open green space. And the other, so, so this, the, the goal for the meadow on top of the garage is to recreate um, conditions that would have been consistent, although this was not a meadow in this area. It was used for agricultural. Um, it's kind of a modern interpretation of that. The other reason for not pursuing solar in this location is because the views from the center building, which is the most significant building on the campus, and the, the DHS secretary sits there and has a view out of this. Um, so to provide a more attractive view. Now, I do believe, and um, I know we've got members of the design team on the call, we are considering putting solar on the roof of the screening building, but will not be on the roof of the um, of the garage itself and Toby I don't know if you're still on if you can confirm that and I, I would also add that one of the design goals that we had was to make the garage disappear so if we turn around and put solar on top of it it will make it very clear that there's a very large building underneath and, and Christy you are correct we are putting solar panels on the screening building that's essentially a net zero energy um, performance on that small piece of the building. I hear you all. I hear you. Uh, and I understand that for aesthetics, you want the secretary to look down on something more attractive than a green roof, than a, than a solar panel roof. Uh, it, you know, I understand. Okay. Okay. Are there any additional questions? Uh, I had a question, Madam Chair. Yes, sir. More, more out of curiosity. So I'm, I was looking at what's there right now where this garage is going to go. And it looks like it's a bunch of old greenhouses. Are those not considered historic or is there any story to them why they're able to, to go? They, they are a historic part of the campus. However, since the very early master plan, since 2008, it has been the intention for those to be removed. Um, and primarily it is because we are trying to keep this as a pedestrian campus and keep the vehicles at the edge. So we're limited in where we could put the, the garages. And, and so that, that really, that's kind of where we're bounded. And so they ended up along there. And some of them are contributing, some are not. They have been documented. Um, at both um, in terms of 
the National Register nomination and historic structure reports, but I believe we also have HAB drawings on some of those as well, the more significant ones. And one other question is based on some of the renderings that were in here. Um, so you, you mentioned pedestrian friendly, and this is right near um, MLK Avenue. There's a bus stop that comes in, but I, it seems like, like I don't see in the renderings like a lot of crosswalks. Like there's this idea that the car comes in, turns to the right. There's like, you have to go to the others. Are, are you guys paying attention to like the need like at, at the gate we itself? We are. And, and we've actually had a number of meetings with DDOT and WMATA talking about shifting that bus stop because right now it happens to the north of the gate. So pedestrians would be crossing if they if they were, were going to try to move it to the other side of the gate. Um, to, to alleviate the pedestrian crossings, we're also looking at our shuttle that comes from the metro and where we locate that to make sure that we don't have pedestrians and vehicles crossing. And the intent is that the vehicle that you know vehicles turning in will turn right in to the, the campus and the pedestrians will go straight. So there's not as much um, and I, I don't know if Olin is on and wants to talk about the, the process that they looked at with the walks, but we've been paying close attention to that. You know that's great. Thanks. Okay, are yes. there any further questions? Oh. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Ms. Boyce. Uh, yes, uh, Chairwoman Goodman and Commissioners. Uh, good afternoon. Hallie Boyce from Olin Landscape Architects. And that's correct. We've looked at the pedestrian circulation both uh, in the campus connecting to existing paths and trails and designating that uh, shuttle stop that you saw in that final uh, rendered view. But we're very cognizant of trying to pull people in from MLK. And uh, Christie's right, we'll be working further uh, to look at those crosswalks, which are critical, obviously, uh, to uh, finessing the relationship between the vehicles and the pedestrians at that gateway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Boyce. Is there, an, is there another question or clarification? No, I, that's good for me for questions. Okay. Okay. Any additional questions? No. Hearing hearing none. Then, um, uh, is there a motion to approve the comments? Madam Chair, I so move. A second. Second. Moved and seconded. Um, we will now open this up for um, comments from the commissioners, and I will start the deliberation then with Commissioner Wright. <laughs> oh. <laughs> There you go, Mina. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I, I'm not going to add to anything. I think the presentation <laughs> speaks for itself. Um, we're very happy with the design um, as it's progressed and um, have had robust meetings with the consulting parties who are um, um, uh, come from a wide variety of organizations, including um, the community as well as design professionals. And I am very pleased with how it's coming along. That's that's about as much as I'm going to say. Thank you, Commissioner Wright. Uh, Commissioner Dixon. Uh, yeah, I um, go, will go along. And I, I do think that if I was the secretary and looked out and saw panels that were drawing electricity, saving us electricity, maybe it's exciting to see the green roof, but I'm, I'm sure that may, maybe I'm, Maybe I got the wrong priorities. I don't know. Thank I you. think can I, 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 I want to come back on that a little bit because <laughs> I, I, it's true. I, I thought you true might. <laughs> true that the secretary's office overlooks the site of the garage. But I think um, with all due respect to the secretary, the more compelling <laughs> reason for not having the solar array there is um uh, uh, one of historic the historic integrity of the campus, as Christy explained, it was a it was a pastoral campus, and uh, and the consulting parties are very dedicated to maintaining um, um, the look and feel of the campus at a particular point in time when it was largely grass and trees. There wasn't a lot of fancy plantings. There wasn't a lot of, um, you know, we're, this This is not the Arboretum. <laughs> there was no topiary gardens. And so we're trying very hard to, to, to um, 
to thread the needle between modern requirements of a level five facility on a national historic landmark. So I think that's the most compelling reason that we don't have um, solar there. Yeah, I, I remember, Neil, remember, I used to play on that grounds mm -hmm. when I was a kid. So I know about what it looked like and how green it is, was. Oh, uh, I think there's a lot of land to keep green uh, around those buildings. But right now we got a big crisis we face in this, in this, on this globe. And Agreed. that's cap capturing energy. And uh, so I don't know, but uh, it's a lot of space that could be get a lot of juice, but maybe the green is important. I understand. Thank you. It's okay. I'm not mad. I just thought. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate um, the input. Thank you both, Commissioner Wright and Commissioner Dixon. Commissioner Cash. I just wanted to emphasize what I was talking about with the buses. I, so, there's a lot of buses go down here. There's dedicated bus lanes down here now. And unfortunately, on the side of the street that this campus is on, that wall comes right up to the sidewalk. And it's a really horrible bus facility if people are continuing on south. But there is that little chunk of grass. So to the extent that there could be any improvements made in conjunction with this oh. project, recognizing all the bus users that, that were hoping to come there, because um, this area is growing so much, it's going to be really important to keep the traffic flowing. We have a new hospital opening up right up the street from it. It's a pretty constrained three to four lane road. So uh, anything we can do to encourage these other modes. It's great that you're keeping the parking to the perimeter. I think that's a, a good thing to do on a campus mm -hmm. like this. But anything we can do to keep the cars away from there and make the transit options as comfortable and inviting as possible, I think is, is just something that's great. So if there's anything, little tweaks you can do recognizing the district transportation side in conjunction with this, I think that would be a, a great thing to do if we have the opportunity. Thank you, Commissioner Cash. <clears throat> Commissioner Cozart. I'm looking to see if you're yeah, still here. I uh, wanted to thank the staff for the presentation and the work on this and just wanted to highlight and encourage staff to uh, continue uh, as this goes forward to make sure the section 106 process is still underway and there's a piece around archaeology that we really need to make sure uh, gets nailed down. So just oh. want the NCPC staff to hmm. uh, continue to uh, work with GSA around that. Thank you. No Thank you. We're cognizant. Thank you, Commissioner Kozar. <laughs> Commissioner McMahon. Um, thanks. Before I uh, give my comments, I just can't help but notice that it looks like uh, Commissioner Wright is, you know, moving or something. I'm looking at her <laughs> bookshelves. <laughs> You'll be missed, ma'am. Um, uh, great presentation by staff again. It's a great project. And while I support Commissioner Dixon on our continuing drive to increase our energy independence um, and sustainability issues, I think this is the right approach to the uh, that piece of property. Uh, so that's all I've got. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner McMahon. Commissioner Stidham. Thank you for the presentation. This project's been going on a very long time. Long time. <laughs> um, and I'm not going to say what Nina, Nina thinks. I'm going to say um, I appreciate the presentation. Um, and thank you for your efforts of trying to maintain the integrity of the campus as you move through this difficult project. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Stidham. Commissioner Argo. I have no additional comments. I'm just happy to see this where it is and in this stage of the development. Thank for thank you to everybody and to the staff for their work on this. Thank you, Commissioner Argo, Commissioner Vice Chair Hewlett. Um, thank you, Ms. Shipman. And I have no additional comments. I'm pleased to support. Thank you, Vice Chair Hewlett and Commissioner Green. Thank you. No, I um Appreciate the, the, the project and the presentation. I'll certainly support it, but I do want to put in a pitch for solar panels. Um, I think I think we need to normalize the presence of solar panels. We've come to accept electrical dis distribution lines, electrical service lines coming to buildings, massive cowlings on buildings, and mechanical equipment is all being you know unavoidable parts of modern life and occupying historic buildings. We just simply accept them, and I think we need to start. We need, to, we need to accept the presence of solar panels, which is a different way of providing power and a better way of providing power and accept the aesthetic that comes with those. Um, but that's not really about this project. That's just a, a, another, a, a larger itch to scratch. But I'd like us to think about that, that to not think about panels as imposition 
In fact, it's less of an imposition than the infrastructure we already impose upon historic buildings. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Green. Appreciate your reflecting on that. Um, yeah, I think this is a very thoughtful design. I think it takes mm -hmm. into consider consideration the historicity of the site, which is so important. I, too, would love to find a way to normalize um, solar uh, power um, in panels so that we could somehow incorporate them into, into our historic sites because we have a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I really do look forward to, um, you know, the further development of the project and um, also support comments that were made previously. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so if there are no further comments or questions, then I would ask Ms. Coster to confirm the motion in the second and call the roll, please. Certainly. Um, and uh, Vice Chair Hewlett uh, made the motion to approve comments on the concept plans for the St. Elizabeth West Campus Gate 1 garage and site development. Commissioner Margo seconded, I believe. Uh, I guess. Uh, and um, with that, Commissioner Kozar. Yes. Commissioner McMahon? Yes. Commissioner Stidham? Yes. Commissioner Hargo? Commissioner Hargo? Yes, yes, she's up. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Vice Chair Hewlett? Yes. Chair Hewlett? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Wright? Yes. Commissioner Dixon? Yes. Commissioner Cash? Yes. And I believe uh, Commissioner Warren may have joined during the presentation or Commissioner. So That's right, Ju Julie. Uh, we're abstain. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you. This um, this motion clearly passes, and I just want to take just, one. I'm sorry, Ms. Vice Chair Hewlett. Did you have something? I heard somebody. Nobody. Okay, no one. Okay. Well, then I was hearing things, and after a long meeting, maybe <laughs> that's happening. I'm sorry, but I just want to thank everyone. Um, I do want to say that it's very, uh, I find it very um, powerful to have so much input from the public. Um, I thought that was a good, um, albeit long, but it's great when people feel strongly about their communities and their neighborhoods and about the environment. So I was uh, uh, feeling good about that today. And thanks, everyone. Uh, it was a good meeting, I think. And we um, we're ready for next month, March 7th, 1 o'clock p.m. on Thursday. Uh, we'll all have uh, to be together again for our regular commission meeting. So see you then on March 7th. Thank you all.